All right, another podcast from the Michigan Institute of Athletics in Brighton, Michigan. It's going to be an awesome podcast today. Right before we get into it, I want to shout out VetLife. VetLife is a 501c3 nonprofit company. It's a company of veterans for veterans. Every veteran faces difficulties when they transition from active duty back to civilian life, and VetLife is there to ease that transition. If you want to reach out to VetLife, you can do so through Instagram or Facebook, or check out their website at vetlifetoday.org. So without further ado, I want to introduce Amanda Holdsworth. Um, I had your husband on the podcast not too long ago. We, we, we just went through the whole episode and couldn't even stop. We ran out of time. He had to head out. Uh, so I'm super excited to see the woman that is alongside that man that's just a go-getter, go, go, go. So um, this is kind of how I start all my podcasts. I want to take it all the way back to the beginning. You know, where were you born and raised? What were you like as a young woman? You know, what were the kind of things that shaped you? What was the family unit life like? And then we'll start to slowly build your story up to today. Sounds good. Well, thanks for having me, James. I appreciate it. Yeah, and Doug was on. And I think he did a great job. You guys had a really wonderful conversation. I'm glad he got to share a lot of his story because it's definitely shaped who he is and, and the man that I love. So um, my name is Amanda uh, Holdsworth. Maiden name is Chaborik. I grew up in LaSalle, Ontario, Canada, and uh, it was a very long time ago. And a great mom and dad, older brother, nine years older than me. So we have, uh, and still to this day, very close. I actually just got back last night from, from visiting with them. So it's a nice little family unit that we have. And you're the youngest child. I am. So it's just the two of you. Yes. You had the big brother to look up to, kind of paved the way forward. You got to see what he got in trouble with. You got to learn Absolutely. from him. Absolutely. A thousand percent. And enough time between us that I could really sit there and go, ooh, should I make that decision? Or, ooh, I do want to make that decision. Or I want to follow in those footsteps. So it was a, a pretty good age gap, I think. I mean, obviously, you're not as close as siblings are, you know, or maybe three or four years apart. And But I think having a brother and sister combination with, you know, nine years difference was really, really very helpful and beneficial to me. Plus, your parents almost got to learn from raising him first and then make the mistakes, do the good, the bad. And then when the baby comes along, the new one, it's like, okay, we're really going to, you know, step it up to the next level because they have experience now they've gone through the parenting thing they've seen what works they've seen good patterns and so basically you're the benefactor of those things by being born second yeah in some ways you know we were joking yesterday that uh you know my brother's actually genius iq and so when i started high school my parents said oh they give you textbooks i'm like yeah of course they did because my brother had gone all the way through high school and never you know brought a textbook home or you know wasn't doing any homework or anything like that he didn't he didn't need to so when I came into school it was like oh you have textbooks you have to study like yeah <laughs> did your brother struggle with organization or like keeping things together or was he one of the people that just aces tests but maybe slacked a little bit on like the homework and the the uh you know the other tasks that come with school because I've met a lot of people that are like that they're ultra intelligent but then they tend to lack some of the other skills because it comes so natural for them I think with my brother uh, a lot of times even now you know he tried to tutor me when I was in college in calculus and I think it messed we were joking it messed me up more because he would say well I don't understand why you don't see this and I'm like I don't I where did these you know the six steps in between he's like I just did it in my head I'm like, but, you know, he didn't show the work. And so, you know, that's where that's probably where the the issues might have come in with him. But his mind is always he's thinking so far ahead. So it just kept me on my toes, too. Right. Because now I have to anticipate as we've gotten older. You know, I know he's here, but he's thinking, you know, four or five steps ahead of where I'm thinking right now and, and keeping up with it. Yeah, that's an interesting dynamic, but it's yeah. probably really good for your growth because it made you like almost view life through a different filter than what you had normally because you're like, wait, what? That doesn't make sense. And he's like, yes, it does. It's right yeah. in front of you. 100%. <laughs> so what were the things that were really impactful to you as a child? You know, we had lightly talked before the podcast that you got into athletics all the way through college. Would you say that you were shaped as a young kid by athletics? Were you shaped by religion? Were you shaped by anything in particular that was a big part of your identity? Yeah, so I think a couple of things, you know, I'm, I'm from Canada and very diverse area and so uh, my dad's parents were immigrants so his dad immigrated from Ukraine his mom immigrated from Poland and was my mom's grandparents immigrated from Ireland so still fairly new into Canada and you had very strong cultural identities on both sides of the family I think that was um, a really neat component you know most of my friends and it was it was always kind of fun growing up I'd get invited to a friend's house and my parents just always would just say you know like Whatever they serve you, just eat it. Like, no, like, do not make faces, shut your mouth, thank them. You know, if they don't speak English, ask your friend to help, you know, translate for you. And it was just, you kind of grew up with a respect for other cultures and this kind of interest in learning about, 
you know, where do people come from and what was their life like? Or when I had friends, you know, I had a lot of friends from Greece, for example, and if they would go back, they're like, oh, I'm going to go back all summer with my grandparents. And you're like, who just, you just get to go back to, like, you go to Greece for the summer? Like, what do you do when you're there, you know? And you get to learn about that. So I think that was a huge component. Um, And then, of course, athletics, which is something that just kind of fell into that nobody really knew I had the athletic ability and just started with field days at school and winning ribbons. And they're like, wow, she can actually you know, play sports. This is cool. And then just kind of going on from there. What was your first sport? Uh, my first sport was gymnastics. Cause I, you know, bounced off the couch and smashed my face <laughs> on the coffee table and, you know, chipped a tooth. And my mom's like, well, we need to get you into something that's a little bit safer. So maybe you go where there are some mats and some trained people here. And so we started with that and it was just something just fun. It wasn't, I've never was a competitive athlete in gymnastics. It was just a safe spot for me to go and um, I think really my first sport, when I think back to it, I mean, I played t-ball and, and softball and things, but really it was soccer that I started to get competitive with. And you know, I was in fifth grade, and we had an elementary school. We were K through K-8 elementary school team, and you could start to try out when you're in fourth or fifth grade, and I tried out. And one of the dads on the team, um, or one of the, the dads of the kids on the team was from England, and he said to my parents after the first or second game, say, hey, you know, would you be interested in trying out for a travel team? I coach, uh, you know, under... 10 girls or under 12 girls, whatever it was at the time, travel team. My parents were like, I don't know, you know, do you want to try? I'm like, sure. And then it just kind of took off from there. And then at the same time in the summer, um, my mom, my cousin came down from up north and to stay with us for a month or so. My mom was looking for things for us to do. And we saw a flyer at the pharmacy for tennis lessons at the park. And so mom said, you guys want to do that? You know, it's like a couple hours. And I'm just, sure. And then, you know, the coach pulled my mom aside and said, she needs to be in lessons. So you need to look for that for fall. So about the same, about the time I was 10 was when, you know, the sports, the competitive sports started picking up. So you're a doer. I mean, it sounds like you, cause you're rattling these off. Like it was no big deal. You're like, oh, I was in T-ball, I was in softball, I was in soccer. I was in this, I played tennis. You're a doer. You're the type of person that you had a strong sense of self-confidence from a, an early age that yeah. allowed you to kind of blunder into these different things. Yeah. And I think, you know, with my parents too, they said, listen, if you want to do something, we'll, we'll sign you up, but you're not quitting. So if it's a six week, you're going to do tap dance in six weeks. And we don't want to hear if you don't like it after a week, you're in it for six weeks. You know, if you're going to play a season of baseball and it turns out you know or softball and it turns out you're not good and you ride the bench too bad like you're you're in it for the summer and I think that teaches you a lot of resilience and also teaches you you know what am I really good at like hone in because I really don't want to sit on the bench and I don't want to you know be second or third string and not that there's anything wrong with that but you know as a kid you kind of learn what is it that I really enjoy doing because the things that I, you really enjoy doing is what you naturally take to you think about it all the time and can't wait to go home and practice and I practice. I grew up on a farm, so I, we had a brick house, and I would just practice on the side, volleying against the the brick for hours after school, breaking shutters all the time. So I know how much I know how much shutters cost because my poor dad had to replace a lot of them, you know. And so I think when you find that that area that you really not only just excel in, but you're just so passionate about that, you just just stick to it. And some of the magic is in the striving. I mean, you're learning how to strive to be better. You're yeah. learning how to, hey, my parents are going to make me stick this thing out and I can stick it out with a crappy attitude and just refuse to really put any effort in because I don't really like it. Or if I'm in it, I'm going to just try to do my best. And if I don't want to continue it, that's perfectly fine. But learning that at a young age is really powerful too, because you're learning how to give your best, regardless of situations that you're going to be presented with in your life learning to just be like, hey, I'm going to do the best I can do. That's like a super powerful trait for a young kid. Yeah, and you also learn, you know, from coaches, right? So playing soccer, we used to have, and it wouldn't matter if it was a travel tournament, we always had to rotate. You always rotated goal, goalies when you were younger, right? And no, nobody specialized back then. Like, you you had your different positions, and the coach rotated us. You didn't care I if didn't it was. I didn't know that. Yeah, at least our coach and, and you know, Mr. Codwell, and, and he passed away several years ago, but he was really intent on, listen, you're going to try every position. You're too young. Like, nobody's specializing. Yes, and maybe there are positions you're better at, but we would take turns playing goal. And I remember one time in a tournament, I think I let in, like, six or seven goals, and I, would, I told myself, oh, my hand my hand hurt. I think I hurt my hand. And he said, okay, I'll pull you out. And then second half, you know, comes around. It was the first half, let in so many goals. Goalie was not my thing. And I saw what oh, my hand feels better, and he's like, oh, you're injured. I'm sorry you're out for the, the game. And, you know, he didn't make a big deal about it, but I subtly knew that, okay, you know, like, he would have rather had me let in 15 goals and stuck it out than to make up an injury. And so I learned that pretty quickly. You didn't have to say anything about it. So, Would you say he was the most impactful coach you had as a child? Or was there one coach that really stood out that, you know, affected your character at a young age? 
Yeah, I think, you know, he was very impactful because he had very quiet leadership. You know, he never, never yelled at us, but it was like a very much almost like my mom's parenting style where you just knew if they were disappointed, you know, like the, the silence or the, the quietness, you're just like, Ooh, we shouldn't have done that. And he was a really great leader in that. And then also got us into British football and, you know, we got to watch and what the, what the pros were doing in Europe. And that was really, really pretty neat. So so as you're getting through school, um, when you get into high school and stuff, are you getting good grades? Do you kind of see the future as being very bright? You already know you're going to go to university. What did you think was next for you? As you're getting out of school, what does life have in store for you? Or what is your vision at that age? See, we had a very different academic system in Canada than there is over here. Um, in Ontario, my province, back when I was in school in the 90s, said it out loud so we can you know talk about the age, but we used to have five years of high school. And by 11th grade, you had to know what you were going to do. So if you were going to go to community college or go into the trades or work, you only had to go up to 12th grade. If you were going to go on to university, you had to do that fifth year, which was called Ontario Academic Credit. Now, since then, the province has done away with that many years ago, but that was how it worked. So basically, almost our, our 13th grade was like a first year. It was actually probably more intense than my first couple of years of university. So it's like college prep, basically, at that point? It's pretty prepare. much, exactly. So you're doing, you know, 45-minute presentations at the end. You're doing, you know, 20 to 30-page research papers. It's... And, but you're tracked. So by 11th grade, you you know, okay, the high school I went to, for example, a lot of people, a lot of athletes, so a lot went into sports medicine, chiropractic, engineering. Uh, so they were tracked in mostly heavy science and math courses. I knew I wanted to do something in communications, kind of following my older brother's footsteps who had gone into radio broadcasting for a while. I was interested in communications, and I was doing a volunteer position at a local radio station and knew I wanted to do something in that, that area. Uh, not necessarily a voice for radio and didn't really want to be the one on TV, but I, I had a feeling I wanted to do that. So I was tracked into more of the writing classes, um, a lot of the social studies, um, a lot of leadership classes. So I learned that way. And so when, I, when it came time to graduate, um, taking a look at, you know, where is it that I'm going to be going? You know, I had interned at the, or did a co-op with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and that was really interesting. And But there weren't at the time a lot of programs that, that was really felt that they would be my niche. And also, you know, university was pretty expensive. And so when it came time, um, you know, recruiters were coming through and they were looking for Canadian athletes because um, it, it was... 1997, you know, Title IX, and we're trying to, you know, equalize men and women's sports in the U.S. And also, you know, at the time, um, a lot of universities would do it to where if they had the higher the GPA, overall team GPA, the more funding they might get from the university. So if you were a female athlete who could transfer in many credits, which I could because of our 13th grade, and you had a high GPA and you're a great player, um, I think, I don't know, I was 50 or 60 colleges, or universities, you know, smaller ones, but we're recruiting pretty hardcore. And so I had the opportunity to be able to come to the States um, for free to, you know, pretty much for free and be able to figure out what I wanted to do. So from then, I just kind of looked at the programs, right? Like, where do you, we didn't really have websites back then to take a look at. So it's the marketing materials and visiting college campuses and figuring out like, what do I want to do? I knew I wanted to do something in communications, but I wasn't exactly sure what. So now how in the world do you make that next decision? You're going to a brand new country. You have 50, 60 choices laid out in front of you. What was it about Tennessee that spoke to you that you said like, hey, this is this is the choice for me. And what was the what was the exact major that you went into? So um, we grew up traveling to Tennessee quite a bit. So it was like a family vacation spot. And I just fell Smoky in love. Smoky Mountains or what? Absolutely. Yep. So it's beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. And, you know, I had done a study abroad in New Zealand between my last year of high school, the summer before, and then my last year of high school, and it was all outdoor ed. And so I'm really big into the outdoors and hiking and kayaking. And so with Tennessee, it was a great opportunity. You get the feel, right? So I was recruited for both tennis and soccer. So some schools maybe only wanted me for tennis, some might only wanted me for soccer. This school in particular wanted me for both sports. And so when I went to go visit the team, because you'd always do team weekends or overnights, um, it was just like the, the feeling of, you know, especially when you're playing a team sport, if, you're, if you just get, again, going back to the gut instinct, if, if you don't have that about a team, I mean, there were a couple schools that 
absolutely loved the majors I loved closer to home you know coaches I loved and my parents loved and and all that but then the team dynamics are going to be a long time if this is the crew that I've got to spend four years with that this is how they are on a visit weekend what are they like on a daily basis you can feel the culture right when you get there absolutely that's like one thing that is just especially if you're a person that's kind of perceptive to that absolutely. you can feel cultures and you're like listen this is a culture that I don't really think I'm going to fit in which is going to ruin my love for this or not ruin it but it's going to definitely put a damper on it and with yeah. that being the case you got to trust your instincts yeah. yeah and that because being in a positive environment life is going to be hard enough you're going to run into enough struggle you got to find a culture that's going to support the spirit that you have yeah absolutely and you know um i just felt at home there it was a small small campus and you know the baseball team would come support the soccer players the soccer players would go support the basketball team the golfers would go support the tennis team so if you're an athlete you most of the people that lived on campus were athletes so your whole life revolved around kind of sports and who's playing this weekend or tonight or who can we go cheer on so that's awesome and it probably helped with the integration process into that new community because like you're all connected in a way you all are athletes for this university from all different backgrounds but you have something in common yeah. and it's a big part of the culture there so what was the name of the university I didn't even ask all oh. I had known it was, it was just in <laughs> Lincoln Finn. Memorial University Lincoln Memorial yeah. University so it's a D2 university that's awesome so now a lot of the times we create a vision in our head of what something's going to be like and sometimes it doesn't end up being exactly what we want. When you moved there, did it work out extremely well for you, exactly as you expected? Talk about like your university experience and then as it starts to draw to an end, unless there was like some shaping moments that you think we should talk about on the podcast, you know, what does that next step look like? Yeah, so, you know, for me, I think I've always been open to new opportunities and, and late in the, in the recruiting game, um, a soccer coach from a school college in Pittsburgh came in but by this time I'd already been down to Tennessee twice already knew everybody knew the recruits knew the players knew the men's team knew both the men's and women's tennis teams like I was I was going there and I remember my dad saying well if you go to the school in Tennessee you're going to get a BA in communications if you go to the school in Pittsburgh you get a business degree and I think you should go and get the business degree that's going to serve you much, much, you know, better in the longer term. Uh, my dad was a tool, tool maker. He was, he was in the trades and, and he felt that, you know, the business degree would be a better route for me. And of course, like any good teenage daughter, I said, I'm going to go to Tennessee, you know, <laughs> it's like, that's what I was expecting. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you don't know the right answer for me. Yeah. I do. I know, you know, and it wasn't, I didn't get as warm, fuzzy feeling as I saw from the soccer team at that point. Um, but they did have an international study abroad program that I was very interested in. But like I said, at this time, I knew everybody. I was on my way to Tennessee to go sign my letter of intent, and that was going to be it. And um, my first day in class at the time, and it's a great school and very uh, many great friends, they, they continued on there. But in my particular program, the dean at the time said, listen, if you want a job in communications outside this area, you're going to need to go to a different school because we just don't have those connections. And I remember calling home to my mom on a pay phone going, I don't know if this is the right decision, but... We'll see how it goes, right? Maybe it's just one one dean, one teacher, who knows? Yeah, that's super bizarre. I mean, you're going to the college on that premise, yeah. and then right off the bat you get that conversation. That probably shakes your whole world up because oh, at that absolutely. point you had an easy path to like, I'm going to love this school, I'm going to be a part of this sports team, I'm going to get my degree, I'm going to go right into communications, and now you have one of the head figures being like, that's not going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and then, you know, the sports, it was very competitive, you know. it's And I think like many athletes, you go as being the top, you know, in high school, and then you, the very few actually go to the top of the high school, and then you're top in college after that. And so they were almost all top of their high school. Yeah, or top you're three. top in the travel, top in high school, top in whatever it is, and then you get to college, and everybody had been top. And so now all of a sudden, you're fighting for starting positions, or gosh, maybe I should have run a little bit more, or lifted a little bit more over the summer, or plyometrics, or something. And all of a sudden, you know, you lose your start, start, uh, starting spot, which happened to me, and I'm going. Okay, so if I'm not here for academics and now I'm riding the bench, you know, what like what am I really here for? You know, if I can't get one or the other or both, is, was this the right decision that I made? That was probably a big period of growth for you. Yeah, it was um, very humbling, right? Dad, you're right. <laughs> That's a <laughs> tough thing to ever know? say, right? Um, and then, you know, trying to go back to the college in Pittsburgh and the soccer coach like, sorry, no place for you here because your spot signed away and I'm not using my recruiting spots next year on transfers. And so it was like, oh, what do I do? But there was opening on the tennis team 
and I could still get my academic scholarship. And so I transferred my um, my sophomore. It was like half sophomore, half junior year because I tra- transferred in credits from high school. So I did that for my last two years. So now you transfer over to Pittsburgh. What is the experience like? Was it better than you had expected? Because I'm sure you're going in with this kind of disappointment from the fact that you had a dream laid out, you had a pathway laid out. It didn't work out that way. Now you take the transfer, which, you know, there were benefits to it. You see the business degree that you're going to get. You see some good things. Thank God you're going to get a spot on the academic team, at least for tennis. When you go there, is it better than you expected? Is it worse? Did you go through any real, you know, personal growth during this period? And then as you're getting out of there, like where, where is the vision pointing to next? Yeah, it was definitely better. Um, it was Robert Morris College, which is now Robert Morris University. And um, my, my degree is actually communications management. So I got to do half communications, half business, like management courses. So it was really phenomenal in that component. Um, tennis team was great. We had a amazing time. Men's and women's team were very close. It was nice to be able to kind of focus and actually have a little bit of off season because when you're playing two sports in college there is there is no off season so um you know it's funny talking with my husband and who had a different college experience and he'll talk about all these things or knowing his college friends and things they did in college I'm like wait that kind of stuff happened because if you're playing two sports plus I work jobs on campus and internships and all that there's there's really not a lot of time with free time it. didn't really exist for you in college free time, free you were time, working or doing something absolutely there there wasn't there wasn't really time and then plus I mean the very first day to be honest the very first day when you go in college and when you start as a freshman you're usually reporting three or four weeks early for your team if you're you know a fall sport and one of the first conversations they have with you is like you're caught drinking you're off the team you know if you we do random drug tests if you're caught with drugs you're off the team you lose your scholarship and if you're from another country you're deported I mean they just like put the fear of God in you so you weren't really you weren't going to mess around and, and and you know push your luck and like have to go and tell your parents like hey I was caught drinking in the dorm so I lost my scholarship can you now please pay for college like that's not you know it's not going to happen so yeah that's going to be an extremely rough conversation yeah. that'd be way worse than dad you were right I think I'm going to go to Pittsburgh yeah. uh, I've lost all the benefits I had for coming here and I'm coming back to Canada yeah that would be devastating yep, so it so. kept you on track absolutely sometimes fear is a good motivator yeah I know <laughs> right like and it was fine for me I was never you know a really big partier anyway but I think it in that case, too, you're not really going to push your luck and probably try a lot of things that everybody or other people tried in college. So so you're getting through Pittsburgh. You graduate from there. You now have this dual uh, specialty where like, mm-hmm. you can do management on the communication side. You can go into communication. You can be in a business leadership role, which is – that's great. I mean, it's a really good umbrella to be under coming out of college. Um, what's the first opportunity look like? Because one of the difficulties a lot of people face is like you don't have the work experience right when you're right. getting out, even though you have the degree. Yeah. So it's hard to like break into the door or did you have an internship like right off the bat? So I had internships in college. Um, and actually it's funny because I found the the letter not too long ago from my internship coordinator. And keep in mind, this is the 90s. And, um, and I know you're too young to remember this, James, but we used to have set hours you could have on internet. So you'd have an AOL package and you get like maybe 10 hours a month that you could be on. And it would have taken like 45 minutes just to even dial up. I remember the dial up yeah. process. I remember the exact sounds. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was, that yeah. was a wild thing. And so I had like my, in, my letter from my internship coordinator that, you know, talked about all the great things about me and then said it even used her own personal internet resources to do <laughs> research for the company. And it's like, wow, like that's, you know, that's really dating it. But I, um, I actually finished my undergrad in three years. I took extra classes, intercession classes. I clipped out of a lot because I thought I wanted to get on the path of work, money, you know, career, like I'm done with school type of thing. And um, I had been offered to stay back at Robert Morris if I wanted to do my MBA there to be covered because you technically get five years as, as an athlete, and I could have used my, my last two there. But I decided no, and I was in the international honors program, so part of the requirement was study abroad. My senior year, they switched seasons for tennis, so my original plan was to go to Monaco for my, my study abroad, but I couldn't because the, the semester switched, and it's like, well, I can't miss tennis. That's paying for half the tuition, so I did it over the summer in the Czech Republic, so I went to Prague over, over the summer, and I did um, summer classes there, and I thought... I'm not really ready to work yet. Like I still want to do something. And I I had a professor that said, listen, you would be really great in PR, which at the time was a pretty newish field. There weren't a lot of programs in it. And I thought, well, what does that involve? And we talked about it's a lot of writing. It's promoting what people are doing. You can work for nonprofits. You can do all these different things with it. And I'm like, oh, that's pretty interesting. I did constant promotions and sport promotions, uh, internships in college. So I applied for my master's, and so I came back from the Czech Republic, and five days later moved to L.A. and went to USC, um, did my master's out there. 
Wow. Yeah. All right. We got to dig into a couple parts of this story before we move on. So you were in Canada. You came to the United States. You got a little bit of a cultural shock there, but I don't think we're that different because I've no. been to Canada. It's not that different. But now you go to Prague. Mm-hmm. You're in the Czech Republic. You're on the other side of the world. You know, what was that experience like? Those It was probably such an enjoyable part of your life. And then when you come back, what sends you to L.A.? So let's first talk about Czech Republic yeah. because that's that's a now you're in a cultural shock. It's very different. Than well, the, the Czech States. Republic didn't feel too different for me because my dad, you know, grew oh, up speaking. You have the background. Yeah. So you know, he grew up speaking Ukrainian Polish around. Um, I he, ne- he didn't really have a lot of patience to teach me too much, but I knew enough, and and a lot of the Czech language was similar. So um, and then at the time, I mean, it was so English speaking there anyway. So um, I got to study at Charles University, which is a very historic university in Prague, and got to take Czech culture classes and got to learn from you know world famous photographers and some just really neat classes to be able to ex- explore. And I've always just had that desire to learn about different cultures, you know, very fascinated with my own um, and just fascinated about learning about others. And so the Czech Republic, it was just an absolute blast. Yeah, that makes sense. There's no, there wasn't a language barrier or some like cultural shock to you then because you almost had the things laid out initially that made it make sense for you to go and visit there. That makes yeah. sense. I, yeah. I see it from a much different light now. Yeah. So you come back, you go to L.A., yeah. So L.A., huge city, yeah. the epicenter of so many things that are going on at once. You're going for your master's at this point. Yeah. Um, what made you decide to go back for your master's instead of jumping into the world of communications? Because you easily could have said, hey, I'm going to get a job now with my degree. What made you say I'm going to go for my master's? Well, it was the last intercession class I did. So intercession is like a summer, kind of like a summer class. So it's basically between the spring semester and summer semester. And it's three weeks and you go to a class four hours a day, five days a week for three weeks, and you can get credits. And I did two of those so I can graduate early. And I had a professor I'd never had in my program. I think he might have been like assistant dean of the, the comm management program at the time. And, he's, and he was the one that said, you know, you really should be looking into PR. And at the time, I, I had no, I had never taken a PR class or anything. So I'm going, and I started to look more into it and talking to him and some of his connections about it. I'm like, wow, this is the path that I was meant for, except I have zero experience. You know, my internships are concert promotions. You know, I was a tutor all the way through. I worked at admissions, you know, but the PR was not it. So I felt that I wasn't yet equipped to, to go on. And so, and I also knew myself knowing that, you know, if I get out there and I'm working and I'm making money to have to quit and go full time to be a, back on a student budget and that, it's it's not going to happen. So it's either now or it's not going to happen. That was really good foresight. The fact that you could look to your future and know yourself well enough to say, you know what, even though that it's tempting to jump right in and start making money and get my life started a little bit more and I'm really giving myself a leg up. Yeah. That's super intelligent that you made that decision and oh, that thanks. you had the foresight to see like, you know, I this PR avenue sounds wonderful for me, but I really don't have the expertise that they're going to be seeking. So let's just go get my master's. Yeah. So you move out to L.A. Yeah. That's very different than Tennessee or Canada. Very There's no different. question. Very different. No question. The people very that are out different. there that just the entire experience. Tell me about L.A. as a young woman. Yes. Yeah, so In the <laughs> early 2000s or yeah, late 90s? 2000 I started. OK. Yeah. So. Um, again, it was another place that I vacationed quite a bit with my parents. So, you know, familiar enough with the area. Um, part of the reason, I mean, my last collegiate tennis match was in the middle of April in snow in Pittsburgh. And I said, if I'm going for my master's, I only applied to warm weather, warm weather schools. And I'd actually been offered a full, full ride graduate assistantship, um, in San Diego at San Diego state university. And I went there and I, and I toured with my mom over, you know, over break and, I liked it, um, but it just there was just something that just wasn't there. And when it's I that went, feel, you've been chasing that feel your whole life. When you <laughs> find the right feeling, you're like, "This is the place Absolutely. for me." Absolutely, you Absolutely. believe in your intuition. Absolutely, and you know, when I went to USC, it's private school. You know, it's an expensive private school, and but I went there, and um, you know, it's part of the spiel that they had, and in, in the marketing, and, and it was. Uh, we're all about connections. They, they call us the mafia in LA because we keep it in the family. You know, if you're 30 years out and there's alum and you need support, you can call on another alum. And, and to me, even though it was this big university in the middle of Los Angeles, it was a very small feel, very small feel with the faculty, very small feel with the program. It did feel very personalized and thought, boy, this would be a great. And, and very wisely at this point when my dad said, I think you should go to USC, even though they're not, you know, we'll support you type of thing. I said, 
I'm going to listen to you the first time around, Dad. And so that's what I did. And unfortunately, I wasn't, um, I couldn't do any scholarships because I was starting in August. And I actually technically had not finished my undergrad because the graduation date of, of uh, my undergrad was like August 30th and classes started August 20th. So I didn't apply. Um, I couldn't get anything. And I was a conditional admit. And so it was kind of like you had to prove yourself because you technically are not done. And my GRE scores were not great. You know, testing, I was like, oh, it's like an IQ test, whatever, and kind of bombed it a little bit. Didn't study for it. But I got into USC, and with about, within about a month, somebody from the International Study Abroad program there had heard that, well, she, I heard that she already did, you know, New Zealand as a, as a high school student and the Czech Republic as undergrad. She might be good for running this program. And so... A month there, I end up getting a full graduate assistantship with a stipend. And plus, you know, the first day on campus, I had a job with USC Athletics doing tutoring. So it was just like everything fell into place perfectly. So to be able to get a degree from USC for free um, was just phenomenal. And I didn't have to rely on my athletic ability at that point. Yeah, that's incredible. The stars aligned for you on that. Absolutely. So many things came together where it was just like, even though you were graduating a little after, and even with these factors, every star just aligned to say, Absolutely. this is your path. Absolutely. So you Absolutely. go to USC, you probably loved it there. Yeah. I love the idea that they're huge into networking and taking care of their people. Yeah. If more communities and families and people in general would just help each other out like good people help good people to rise up everyone can come up together networking is massive it's massive but so many places it's this like weird unspoken like competition competition between like even family members and members of community and then they don't open doors for other people and like that's not the way that a healthy society really should be i love that that's their motto that like hey if you're a part of this like we're going to go all in for you because you're going all in with us absolutely i mean to this day i could call up and even you know most of my faculty have retired there's still a couple that are that are there and i'll call up and say listen, I'm in a bind or I, I'm thinking about taking this on and I'm not sure, can I talk to? And they'll hook me up with like another assistant professor within 24 hours. That's Usually amazing. Usually somebody gets back to me and they'll talk it through and it's, and I don't, I'm not paying for the service. It's just the fact that mentality, I graduated in 2002 with my master's and that mentality for 20 years has carried through and it's very true. And so for me, um, I think that was probably laid the foundation for me interested in education marketing. That's that's a culture of excellence. Those are people that are going in together to help each other be successful and to like have each other's back for real. That's really excellent to yeah, hear. Yeah. I didn't know a lot about USC. Obviously, I know the school, but yeah. I've never really sat and spoke to someone that went there and, you know, could tell me that firsthand. Yeah. So you come out of there. It's time to get into the working world. You've got your master's now. You've basically, you've built up exactly as like the success story would be if you told your child from a young age, like, hey, you're going to go to school, you're going to play some math, you know, sports, you're going to do all these different things. You've met, you've done it. You've followed the roadmap. Mm -hmm. What does your first, you know, uh, career position look like? What does your vision look like at this point? Where do you see yourself? Like if we would have spoken to the 22 or 23 year old or at that time, you're probably what, 25, 26? No, because I finished in three years my undergrad. Oh, so wow, I think yeah, I graduated. you were ahead. I was like 23 when I graduated with my master's. So. Okay, so you're t- what would the 23-year-old Amanda have said that her life was going to look like at this age? Like, what was your vision pointing to? And then let's just start to talk about that period of your well, life. Well, the 22-year-old Amanda thought that she was going to USC to learn about sports PR because it made natural sense, right, for a former athlete. Then I worked for USC Athletics when I was there. And that was makes sense. And the football team was exploding, and so... Um, I thought I would, and, and I had a professor, and I won't name the major league sports team to throw him under the bus, but, you know, I said, hey, come come interview with me. I'm, you know, I was vice president of corporate communications for one of the, the major league sports teams out there. And he said, okay, so it's PR, PR coordinator, entry level, 32000 a year. And I said, for the season? He said, no, 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 for the year. And I said, we're in L.A. Like, I wouldn't be able to eat, you know. And even 20 years ago, it's not that inflation was that much. I mean, 32000 wouldn't have gotten me an apartment for for the year. And you're, I mean, that's a master's student yeah. doing PR for a billion-dollar operation. Yeah, and said, you know, here's the thing. I've got 5,000 resumes for this job. And so at that time, I'm like, you know, maybe sports is not the path. Um, because it's true, right? It's whether it's sports broadcasting, sports journalism, you know, sports PR, sports marketing, almost every former athlete wants to do something in, in sports and kind of keep that connection. So are you willing to sacrifice cost of living? You know, you're going to be working 60, 70 hours a week during the season, if not more, right? Your life is going to be there. 
and I'm 20, you know, 22 going on 23, getting ready to graduate and thought, you know, I don't really think that this is necessarily the path. So now you probably have unreal growth potential in an area like that. But yeah, you'd have multiple years of extreme sacrifice where you're probably living with multiple roommates and doing what you have to do to barely get by. And then hopefully if you are one of the exceptional people that stands out, you could grow tremendously because sports are like, you know, multi-billion dollar operations, but that is a risky path. And you were just like, no, I'm not going to roll the dice on this. And it's a risky path for female, right? Like I, I was never like, Oh, I can't wait to get married and have kids. Like that's the number one goal, but you have that in mind Go, Okay. If I invest the next decade of my life into this and I get to be a VP somewhere and then I decide I want to have kids I'm already in my 30s and like how is that even sustainable and so like the women that have done it I have like hats off because I don't know how they did it extreme sacrifice I mean extreme sacrifice and so I think for me it was uh, and I was interning I was an intern at a sports PR agency I interned at a high-tech PR agency high-tech PR agency offered me a job and I just thought I can't push widgets. I mean, at the time, I think it was like 3G, maybe 2G. I don't know, maybe something like that. I don't know what the technology was. But I was such a late adopter of any technology, still am to this day, that it was just kind of like, I can't, like, I cannot fathom doing this. And and I liked it at first because we were working with clients around the world, which was something that um, I got to do with my study abroad program and, and something that was very interesting to me. But then when I realized that my boss was on calls at 3 o'clock in the morning with the Italian client because they had to be, I'm going again, like, you know, it's, well, how do I want my life to look? I don't mind working hard, but like when you're sacrificing something for somebody else that's expected and not even, you know, anything that you're going to be getting anything extra for it, it's, you have to kind of weigh the, the pros and cons. And I thought, I just can't, like, I, I can't even find things to write about or pitch about this because this is so, and to other people that do it again, that's awesome that they found it. But I was like, I can't, if in working in PR media relations, if you're not passionate about the topic or what you're writing about, like the ideas dry up like this. And how do you justify when you do have to work those 60 hour weeks? Like, what are you actually doing it for to push somebody else's widget? Or are you doing it for a cause? Yeah, that's inc- that's incredible insight that you just dropped. If your passion is not there and you're really not invested in the cause, you're going to give such a dry, bland, cookie cutter, you know, product over time. You might start with a little bit of fire. Absolutely. But if your heart's not in it, it's going to dry up fast. When, that, when the going gets tough, like where are you going to be? Yeah, one hundred percent. You got to find something that you are passionately, you know, wanting to move forward—a cause that you want to be a part of. Something that, like, you're a little bit of that fire inside that we all have is going into that writing. It's really yeah. pushing that, you know, message, statement, brand, whatever it is. So, when's the first time that you really find something where you get that feeling again? Well, you know, when I w- going back to when I was a graduate student, I was running this this study abroad program, and I just loved promoting it. I loved talking with students, like going through applications, like figuring out how we're going to do this, organizing it, teaching because I was a grad assistant, teaching or grading papers, and I really enjoyed that. And so, but I never really thought of education as you know with PR marketing because all my classmates were either from USC, where they were starting their own agencies, or they were going to some of the big, like the world's biggest ones. Like one of my best friends went to you know, London for a while and worked at, you know, one of the biggest PR agencies and, you know, jetting off to Milan or Paris or something like that. And it's so when you kind of thought of like a school, you're like, oh, I don't, I don't really know about that. So um, I had moved to Boston after graduation and it was unfortunately the spring after 9-11 and was biotech bust. And for so many people, there weren't jobs, there were no, no new jobs, people weren't hiring. So it actually took me a while to find a job, which was frustrating because if I would have stayed in L.A., with USC, it was just like, they're like, who do you want to interview with? It was almost like that. And you had job offers from internships and you go somewhere trying something new and you're going, oh goodness, like my student visa is running out in like three months. I've got to find something. So um, I got in with a hospital and um, I think it was my third week on the job was Christmas. And they said, well, you can't go home. Like you, hospitals don't close. Like you need to work. We need you on the Christmas Eve shift. So you need to be here till eight. And then Boxing Day, which is a big holiday in Canada, they're like, well, we need you back in at 8 a.m. that day, but you're going to have Christmas off. And I was like, <laughs> and I remember just sitting like just, it was a church. I was just crying. Like the first time I never could be, couldn't be with my family. And I'm going, well, this obviously isn't it because like I, I need to find something that I can balance my life with. 
Yeah, that's huge. What brought you to Boston? I didn't hear Boston anywhere in your story. And then I, you're like, oh, I'm in Boston. I'm almost ashamed to admit it, but I followed a boyfriend. So, which I always said I would never, ever, 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 ever do. But L.A. wasn't my scene. I knew I wasn't going to stay in L.A. It was it just, you know, the affordability. It just it was just a different, different area. And um, it was great to vacation. You know, my best friend's still out there. It's We go to visit. I mean, that's awesome. But it wasn't going to be your home staple. It was it's not, not where you were going to raise a family. It was it's- not. Like, my birthday's in December, and, like, sitting there, I'm going, it's not even, like, people are riding around in Santa Claus hats and convertibles. This is just odd to me. This doesn't feel like Christmas or, like, at you know, all. Like, you know, especially in places like Seasons, where we're from, your body signals, like, when it's time to slow down, that it's okay to slow down. And when you're sitting there in January kind of praying that it's going to rain on Saturday so you, like, you can have an excuse to stay in and watch movies all day and be lazy, you know, it's like your your body has no signal that it's time to slow down, that it's okay to slow down. So it's just go, 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 go. Yeah, and that's something that kind of destroys people's mental health over time is the people that do not give themselves time to slow down. And in places yeah. like that, like L.A. is go, 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 go. That is the mindset. I mean, if you're not hustling, you're living on the streets. Absolutely. That's. I mean, yeah. and that's kind of how it is. Yeah, or you're going to be living with roommates. Exactly, you know, or it's like, going to be a struggle yeah. to the fullest if you're not going all in Or like you're going to commute. You know, my husband now always laughs. He's like, he doesn't believe me that my roommate and I used to find dates on the highway. And he's like, how, like, how is this even... I'm like, well, you're sitting in traffic for an hour, hour and a half, and you're not moving, and everybody's in convertibles or the window's down. You just start talking, like, hey, you want to pull over for a drink? You know, we're not going. I'm like, of course, this was like, I hope my children ever yeah, did I was this. Say, like 20 um, years ago, like, you know, we didn't have, like, I don't know, the, the murder scene. And actually, like, everything was dead. probably the exact same way it was. It just wasn't <laughs> as well known, like, because the internet didn't connect us all like it exactly, did now. Exactly. But, I mean, because that, that isn't that uncommon from back in the day. That's like, no, you, I'm talking to other people. Why is that strange? I'm sitting, I'm sitting here in traffic Now anyway. you're telling your children, like, don't, I know, don't touch. ever do that. <laughs> know. Don't even look at them for 10 seconds. I know. Do not make eye contact. Keep your windows rolled up. Like, nope, nope. You're not allowed to do it's that. It's wild how things change over time and probably how we change over time because absolutely. you have a different worldview oh, now absolutely. than you did at 20. Oh, yeah. You look back, you're like, I'm so lucky I was not murdered somewhere at some point. But, you know. So you follow a boy to Boston that doesn't work out. Yeah. You're going through a tremendous growth period because you're now trying to figure out, like, okay, I did it. I got my degree. I have this. Ah, the hospital's not for me. This is not for me. It's funny because education is almost right there in your story the whole time. Yeah. Like it's like right behind the scenes. Yeah. You have this love for guiding other people. You have you love the studying abroad. You liked the roles that you played in helping others with these avenues. But it had never like fully clicked to you. Yeah. When does it click? And what's the first like major step where you're like, okay, that is what really put me to where I am today. So. I think for me, um, when I was at the hospital, I was only there a few months, and I was I got recruited for a job, and um, it was for Special Olympics Massachusetts, which I was like, ooh, sports. I could be director of PR at 23 or 24, whatever I was at the time, um, for the entire state. Didn't pay anything, but you had a nice title, and you got to do something great, and met some phenomenal people, you know, a couple with it, which are still very close friends with, you know, 20 years later, but... Um, I learned a lot about storytelling there, and I learned a lot about the impact that my work could have on other people. So whether it was, and you know, I won a New England Public Affairs Campaign of the Year for a year's worth of work that I had done there, and it was all based around storytelling and utilizing athletes and their parents to tell the story about what Special Olympics meant to them and their family. And so for me, it was a whole new world of creativity that it could tap into and the freedom to be able to meet so many different people and to tell their stories in non-promotional ways. So meaning like, you know, we could take this athlete's story and the, the whole headline is not about Special Olympics. It's about the impact that this family had from, you know, volunteering at the event and then now having, you know, a, a son or daughter who is involved in Special Olympics or the impact of, of, um, uh, of a brother and I remember one in particular it was a front page article that we had gotten it was the two brothers one was a special olympics athlete one wasn't and it was a unified program where they they could compete together and so the families the impact on the families by being able to say hey we get to watch both our sons in one basketball game and to be able to tell that story in different ways that wasn't pushing a widget and it wasn't um for somebody else's own good or deep pockets this was to tell these great stories and hopefully get more funding and have more people attend the events and just raise awareness like these are athletes these are families these are people they deserve the same respect that that you and i deserve and and we should pay attention 
and we got to do, you know, they did the World Games in Ireland, which obviously living in Boston, a lot of um, Boston Irish, it was like a huge ordeal and end up, you know, getting to have a Special Olympics Day with the state and just just to be able to do these things to move the needle, I think really, really clicked with me. So that was the first. So then you're reconnected with something that you're passionate about. You're like, wow, this is great. Like I'm making a difference. Stories are incredibly great. powerful. Stories Absolutely. can captivate nations, can move people. You know, people get behind stories. So if you're a storyteller in culture, yep. you have an incredibly powerful position because you can drive action. Most human beings are driven by their limbic system, yep. right? I mean, this is a basic psychological principle. So the way that we feel tends to drive our actions. Well, guess what? When we read an incredible story that touches, you know, that taps into your spirit or whatever it is, that is very likely to change viewpoints, to make you engaged with something, to make you step up with empathy or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But you're the storyteller. That's that's an incredible role to play. And that's got to be something that you probably take a lot of pride in but you're also you know how important that role is right yeah it was uh I, I loved my time there again you know we worked insane hours for my uh you know very little money and I worked I was actually um online faculty at the time and you probably laugh because we send like cd-roms that we used to send back and forth because it would take too long to upload assignments but I was doing like online teaching at the time and you never saw each other because like zoom and things didn't exist so it was like an online chat board and then yeah, the world mail is in. so different now. So different. So I was doing that, and, you know, a, a good friend of mine that um, that's still in touch with it that went on in sports and, and is in, in a high-ranking position, we always joke, we're like, God, we were so poor. Like, you know, we go to Costco and split, like, the dollar. It was the time. It was a dollar hot dog special, and, you know, we'd split it. Or, you know, we go to the, the – there was a Mexican restaurant around the corner from us, and, like, three of us would go, and, like, one person would order, you know, a quesadilla, and then we'd eat the free chips and salsa. It was just, like – you know, you're just stretched, but you love what you did, but it just didn't pay. Yeah, 100%. But in a weird way, I feel like those times, because I've had times before I am where I am now, where I was like so broke and just running on passion and a dream. Yeah. When you look back, those are really beautiful times because you're not operating because of a paycheck. No. Absolutely. Clearly. Yeah. You are operating based on purpose, based on vision, based on where you want to be. Those are really beautiful times of personal growth. And they give you a really good sense of gratitude for things that you have later on. Oh, absolutely. Because you remember those periods. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, um, and you know, you have to kind of reevaluate too. You're living in a major city. You know, when I moved to Boston, you know, L.A. was so expensive. And I remember looking in the classifieds, like apartments. And I'm like, oh, here's one, you know, 500 bucks a month. And I finally, like, read it, and it's a parking spot, you know. And it's, like, you started to go through. And I remember I finally found a roommate, and it was still, like, so expensive. It was more expensive than L.A. And I'm like, I don't get it. Like, L.A., they always say we're paying for sunshine. What are we paying for here? And she was a native from Boston, and she was in her accent. She said snow removal. I was like, that was it. But, you know, it's at the point, too, where you're like, okay, I'm in my mid-20s. I come from an area where a lot of my guy friends went into the trades, you know, so they're making bank when – I'm in college and you know, you're scraping together literally dimes to go to Taco Bell on a Saturday night and they all have starter homes and new trucks and new snowmobiles and that's fine for the first few years and after a while you're like okay I've been in this game for like many years now I've got three degrees at this point of associates bachelors and a master's and you just think like how is this even sustainable like I don't want to have to live with a roommate my entire life like I'm in my mid-20s like I'm, I've got two roommates I you know I, this might not be the path for me so then what changes? What what changes do you make? So that's when I got into education. So um, so how does that happen? Because that's what you're doing now today. So yes. this is like the big moment. Yeah. And so that was 20 years ago. Um, you know, I'd worked at, at USC um, quite a bit. And when I was at Robert Morris, I worked in admissions. So I, I knew, knew the industry, obviously. Um, and I got into that. It happened to be, you know, two blocks. It was a grad school, two blocks from my apartment. So, which is unheard of because everybody's always, you know, commuting in Boston. And um, it was just a really great opportunity. So I had been straight PR at this point, which um, for those in PR, we always say we don't pay for anything, right? So our work comes in trying to get somebody to believe in us enough to talk about it. And so I got to work for a director of external affairs who had an advertising background. And it was the first time I learned about really about marketing and putting the ad dollars and ROI and how they can all play in together because communications is very broad. So how do you get advertising? How do you get marketing? You know, how do you figure out the budgets for that? What's your ROI on that? And how does PR play into that? And so um, great success, you know, right off the bat. It was, uh, I think, the turning point for me, taking that storytelling element that I got to do at Special Olympics 
and bring it there and being a young person and just going around and just meeting deans and whoever wanted to meet with me, I would have conversations. And I was there about three weeks and it was a 2004 ALCS. Um, Red Sox were in it. That was the year that they ended up reversing the curse, um, which was absolutely insane to be there for that. Um, and Kurt Schilling had a bloody sock. And the speculation through, you know, ALCS, like, oh, my God, what's happened? He's, you know, our ace, what's going on? And I just happened a couple of days before to meet the a dean, the assistant dean of the physical therapy department of the grad school, and, and one happened to be a foot and ankle, ankle expert. And I knew she was super personable and very bright, and I called her, and you know, because we call home phones at the time, not a lot of people have cell phones. Yeah, yeah. And I said, hey, if I pitch you to the Boston Globe and they want your comment, can you actually like comment on this without speculating too much about what's going on with Kurt Schilling? And she said, absolutely, I know exactly what probably, what probably is happening. And so I pitched her, pitched her to the Boston Globe, and it was the first ever mention of this graduate school in the Boston Globe sports section, which dailies were the king back the king and queen back then and so and she got national press and became the the foot and ankle expert for many years for the boston globe whenever there was injury with um, one of the professional athletes and so that was about two or three weeks in the job and i was like and again it wasn't outright promoting the graduate school it was somebody within the community who could offer what we now call as thought leadership but at the time it wasn't being utilized as a pr tactic so i think for me that got me hooked because here I am around experts in all these different industries and all these different fields and all these different niches. Like who would think that, you know, right around the hall, the corner, you'd have a foot and ankle expert that's working in sports and has, you know, years of experience as a, as an athletic trainer, but actually has a doctorate in the field and can talk about her research and teaching in that area. So then it's when I was like, ooh, education is kind of a gold mine. Yeah, 100 percent. And that is a wild story that you just made those connections. You saw how the pieces would fit. You made a phone call to the right people because you took initiative there and said, hey, there's there's an opportunity that this works. And then it was a massive breakthrough almost. It sounds like putting her on that platform. The terminology that you used, I've never heard that said before. Thought leadership as a PR tactic. Yeah, that is brilliant for many companies because you're trying to form people's opinions, right? Like that's what so many companies are trying to do, especially their PR department. They're trying to form opinions on a wide variety of things, uh, of course, including the company, like the better opinion that people have of a company, the more they're willing to support it, the more, more exactly. they're willing to give their dollars, et cetera. I've never heard that term before, thought leadership. W- yeah. That was just coming to fruition around that period. They were starting to figure out that they could take right. experts and then have them be like the, the, you know, basically the ones that create the overall view that others will subscribe to. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, and I don't even know if it was coming out at that time, you know, kind of going back to uh, my grad program at USC, you know, the, the major was strategic public relations. And so what the strategy is a huge component of research, planning, and evaluation, which you don't see in a lot of programs. And so it always differentiated us because – we understood that we had to research reporters. We had to always be thinking of different angles. And it, we had a plan, but sometimes you can go off that plan, but you had to be able to evaluate your results as you know, as part of it. And so I always go, but Jerry Swirling, who used to have the program, was one of like the godfathers of PR, was you know my mentor when I was there. And that was always one of his things was, you know, look for those hidden stories that are actually right there, right? So these are stories that you wouldn't really look at typically but that's somebody that's right there. And so I don't even think thought leadership really became a big term until the last few years when you have all these online gurus and people saying, oh, I'm you know, creating thought leadership pieces or et cetera, et cetera. And even now it's still, and you know, I know we'll get to this, but even in the work that we do, it's very hard to get organizations' minds wrapped around the fact that we're taking, instead of the straight path to PR, like putting a release on the wire or promoting their company outright, we're taking this super curvy road, but there's a purpose to it because it's part of the plan. Yeah, a little bit of the subtlety of that is actually probably more effective because people can easily identify just a basic PR campaign now. Right. You can easily be like, that is just someone promoting a company because they work for that organization. Yeah. Versus like a subtle thing where you're telling a story that you get people to buy in. Well, what story are they buying into? Well, what does that lead to? Well, what's the ideology behind that? That's really intelligent stuff. And it's probably incredible strategy behind the scenes. There's probably so a lot much. of work. People do not understand the amount of work that goes into a proper PR campaign. I mean, and and you have clients that, 
you know, in the past be like, oh, we'll pay you by hour. And it's like, oh, you ready to pay for 40 hours of me researching reporters? And nowadays, like following them on Twitter, commenting on their articles, sharing their art, like it's, it's just an insane amount. So, you know, with the thought leadership, it goes into many people in marketing know the, um, no like trust factor, right? So that we know that we have to get people to know us, we have to get them to like us, and they're going to trust us to buy a product. Um, and that's really no different in, in this PR tactic, except the end result is not necessarily sales. The end result is for people to look to you. And the whole goal is that when that reporter needs another source, they're going to come right to you because they know that you've You've picked up the phone whenever they've called, whether it's good or bad, you know, and, and that's my old school PR that I really miss, you know, a lot sometimes the relationships, but we work really hard with that. But when you're giving with a thought leadership, it's not selfishly in mind, right? So it's not, hey, I want to, I want you to get me on TV to promote the great research project I just, I just did, or I want you to promote my organization or my company or my school. It's, I have knowledge in this area. And I want to share it, and I don't care if this doesn't go anywhere, but I'm just so excited to talk about this and share it that I'm willing to do it, and I'm willing to do it over and over again. And I don't have uh, an intent in mind other than to raise brand awareness. And so there are different components. I always joke now on LinkedIn, and I've said this for 15 years, I can always tell whenever anybody's looking for a new job because they're posting feverishly on LinkedIn, or now they're writing articles on LinkedIn. And and it's happened three times in the last week where people, I said three months ago, I'm like, well, so-and-so is going to be out. And you know, we have bets with friends, like, no, I think you're wrong, every single one. So you can see when people are just doing it for a cot, like I'm, I want a new job or I want new business or whatever the case is, versus somebody that's just continuously sharing their knowledge and there's a very big strategy to it because it's also poor business decision to be able to share too much but in the education world you have these researchers they spend their life and now having been through it myself you're like somebody wants to hear about my research i will what do you what do you want to know do you can i buy you dinner and share it like they're just so excited that somebody is is excited about that yeah, this is a fascinating conversation because I don't hear like I don't have conversations like this very often. But you're you're working master strategy moves behind the scenes that draw, drive public action, opinion, and many other things. Right. This could also be used in an incredibly destructive way because by understanding what drives people, what creates a successful PR campaign, that can be used for good or bad. You could be supporting all kind of ideologies that are maybe not conducive of a healthy society or healthy future. But if you have master strategists behind the scenes that understand how to, like you said, through almost like a subterfuge, Mm -hmm. like create this, you're shaking your head a ton. I'd love you to speak more on that because it's, it's almost, you carry such an important responsibility because you're going to be able to drive action and shape the opinion of a lot of people through this type of work because you understand the demographics so well. You understand what drives people. You understand how to get their emotional connection. Like that's the art of what you're doing. Now the question is like, well, what are we driving them to? And you're probably against competing forces. Like let's say you're trying to support any cause. There's probably a group of you on the other side doing the exact same thing for the others. Like, right. do you see this a ton? Because you probably see life through a different lens when you witness campaigns and things like this. Absolutely. Do you see a lot of this in media? Do you see a lot of this in political campaigns? Do you see a lot of this across the board? There is, and but there are also components of PR, like professionals. So I've got my APR, which is Accreditation in Public Relations, and I got that about 14 or 15 years ago. And we have an ethical code. Um, and it's if actually, you choose to follow it, well, you could also be stripped of your APR, which is kind of, it's like a, getting a second ma- or getting a master's or getting a second master's. It's a pretty intense process to go through it. Um, you do a lot about legal, a lot about ethics, um, and those components. So I haven't seen knock on anyone. I haven't seen any way have gotten stripped of those, but the people that I work with or have, you know, connections with who have that are, have very strong ethical codes. But you don't, so you have, haven't seen any examples in our culture of people that are clearly not following oh, ethics? Oh, absolutely. They're, but they also don't have an APR attached to, to them. It. And they might not be, um, and you know, there are some some PR people that are using it, you know, using what they know for whatever their purpose is. But personally, I haven't seen anybody, at least I know, or the circles that, that I've run in over the years. Um, I think that's the beauty of working in education nonprofit. Um, sure. You don't see too much of that. But there is a there is a huge danger, right? And a lot of companies don't want to go this route. And, and even now, working 
more than 20 years now in this field, there is a danger of putting one person in front of in your organization. And we've seen this through advertising and marketing campaigns. We've seen this through buildings that have to have the name stripped of them. We've no, seen I can, them I can think of a million so, examples, yeah. So there is that danger. So for me, it's like you don't put all your eggs in one basket. You diversify. You know, to part of the tell the overall story and overall brand awareness, it's not one person. Even if you have one person that's the most amazing president of a university that ever could be possible, they're probably going to fall at some point. You know, there's always something behind the scenes, whether it's on them or somebody willing to take them down for skeletons in the closet pre, pre-internet. It's happened. Yeah, no, and you've seen examples all across culture. You're referencing a bunch without saying any in particular mm-hmm. right now. But like, and there's been a strange shift where, cause when you said the word statues, this triggered this, where we're almost like very adamantly against history. Whereas like history is what it is. It's not, it's there to learn from. It's there because it existed like that before. It's there to teach us great lessons. It's there so you and I and our families and our children grow up in a world where we recognize how off the rails things can go, while yeah. why, how badly things can be in the past. And we learn from those experiences. But to try to shape them into like, well, we don't want that to be there anymore. It, it, that's just the truth is what it is. We need to do a better job. Um, and I guess I don't even really want to dig into that because that's going to take us off on a separate <laughs> tangent. That's what I, I was trying to that's say whole, it without that's saying other, it. That's a whole other public awareness campaign. But you're right. I mean, in, in situations like that, there should be a PR for good, right? 100%. That should be saying, you know what? We need to learn from this. And here are the resources that we have. And here's a museum that we can go to. And this is where everybody Yeah, like the learn. Holocaust Museum is a, is a phenomenal thing yeah. to exist. Because if you don't learn from history, the Holocaust isn't, a, isn't an isolated example. There are countless examples throughout human history where atrocities have taken place across all cultures, right? That if we don't learn from that, don't, like, we're likely to repeat it. Or we're much more likely. Absolutely. So these are good things, yeah. but I don't really see the campaigns as adamantly in support of them, like you just alluded to, as I see campaigns that are adamantly trying to destroy certain parts. Yeah, it's very interesting. You know, it's um, we're a very branded culture anymore. You know, I've said this years ago, or even just researching on social media, and you'd hear friends say, well, so-and-so's life looks so perfect. And I said, it's their brand. Do you think that so-and-so is going to be on there writing about problems with their significant other or that their kid failed the math test or their kid was third string on the football team like no because everybody's so concerned with cultivating their own presence and their own brand that it's the good that we've learned from things like PR and marketing has seeped into now everyday life yeah that can be really dangerous though cuz a lack of authenticity and a lack of like the reality and the truth and the way things are you're creating a facade that is not real you Absolutely. are pretending to live in a world that you do not live in Absolutely. you're you're disconnecting from being a human being all human beings have ups and we have downs yep. so when you refuse to show any of the downs you're building a glass structure or something you're like a house of cards you know what i mean that people are like that's not reality that's not the world as it is that's only a presentation and that's a dangerous road to go down because it can create all kind of psychological effects absolutely you know with authenticity and you said it you know you had my my husband on who you know early on his career we you talked about selling kirby's and i tell him now with with his team sometimes and and my doctor i focused a lot on um, employee engagement organizational culture and I said, you know, I think that they need to know, like they need to see, they need to hear that, you know, there's maybe times that you had to fill your, your trunk with corn from the farmer's field because you didn't have money to eat. Like people think that, I think especially successful people or, or people who are entrepreneurs, they think, you know, oh, that's, that's amazing. They have an amazing life and they own this and that, but they don't realize the struggles that shape them and how, how they were. So I think staying authentic, especially when you have have had struggles with that, you know, even with, with Doug's company, one of his companies with QFL, I mean, they started in this office in Warren that I swear you'd blow a tire, like whenever you dry down because the potholes were so bad. And it was an area that were, where they were in particular, there had a lot of break-ins after hours and things. So they kind of had to be out of the office early or else, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, where is he? I haven't, you know, haven't, haven't heard what's going on. Like, what's the call? Or just even getting, getting calls from customers at two o'clock in the morning and we have a baby and he's got to be sleeping on the couch in the basement because he's going to get calls all night. You know, you talk about being the authentic self. If you don't tell that part of the story, it's the exact, I think it's just doing as much harm 
as what you said when people try to cultivate these perfect lives because there's not that understanding there and people are very 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 quick to judge on what they see and and appearances or these professors that maybe are on you know when they work with higher ed they're speaking all over the world and people say well of course they did because you know they've had the connections well no they slogged out their phd for seven years and they had a dictator for you know the dissertation chair who made them rewrite their dissertation nine times and they had to fight for tenure and then they got tenure and they had they just don't know the story and i think i think when we don't share that or at least figure out how to shape that as part of the history of whether it's a person or an organization it just leads to um dangerous branding down the road one thousand percent and i think if we just clipped that part and put that online it's incredibly powerful what you just said the honesty matters the yeah. truth matters yeah. the world isn't like you can't just get to a certain level and say all of the struggles and downs and mistakes and insecurities are things that happened to me or that I went through or had to overcome. They don't exist anymore because I'm this. No, you're actually undercutting your own power. Yeah. The real way to impact the world is to be authentic and it's to be who you are because then you know what? Your message can reach that struggling youth, that mm -hmm. kid that comes Absolutely. from a broken home that doesn't have much going for them right, right now. And when they hear there's a ton of struggle in your story, they go, maybe I can build up to. Absolutely. And that's why representation matters across the board, whether it's different races, different cultures, different languages, male, female, transgender, whatever it might be. In my mind, if, if a, especially because I work in education, if a student doesn't see somebody in that kind of position or they're not exposed to it, how can you, I mean, how can you ever really, you know, like I, I grew up with grandparents that didn't speak English. So when I work with immigrant refugee students and I've had this even with potential clients say, well, what do you know about immigrant and refugee students you well, like, more than you a, would think i'm i'm you know caucasian i've got a british last name and i've had to say this to boards and i'm like well actually i'm an immigrant who has been deported my grandparents spoke broken english and my first language wasn't english so what would you like to know that how do you think that i can serve those students better than you can i mean and and that's just the way the way that the world is right we've got to figure out you know, there are representation definitely matters. And there are also groups of people that want to help and use their skills for that. One thousand percent. And I think that's a huge thing that luckily is shifting for the better in culture. People are you're seeing, you know, any level of culture. If you looked at the movies, superheroes of all races, all colors, Absolutely. men and women, you know, versus back in the day, there was just Superman. Right. Like that was he was like Absolutely. the American icon. So it's good to show these kids that like. It's painted on the gym wall out there. It says we are all one, and that's why we have the flags of all the nations hanging. Is because, like, I look at it. Like, when you're a martial artist on the mat, I don't care if you're rich or poor or white or black or – you know what I care about? Are you a good person? Or are you trying to be better? Mm -hmm. And if you're not a good person now, like, do you at least want to be? Yeah. You know what I mean? Do you want to be better than yeah. your past? Or what are those biases that you have? And what are those unconscious? I've done unconscious bias training, which is very eye-opening and things. So I, th I think all of that is, you know, as, especially as you get older and especially as an entrepreneur, you need to really be aware of those components. Well, and I think some of it is natural. Yeah. Like, I believe bias does exist and everything. Like, I have preferences to who I'm attracted to. That could be considered a bias. What if I'm only attracted to a certain race? That bias doesn't exist by my choice, but like if my attraction is to someone or, you know, for any certain thing, certain biases are just part of the world, right? But then we have to figure out what biases are not healthy or can be damaging to other people. Exactly. Like if this person is underlined, that means these things. Like the more we get into that type of ideology, it's a very slippery slope. Like that is stereo stereotyping at its finest, but yet like um not to again bounce off topic too much because i want to get in the education part of your story i witnessed like messaging going out to the culture like all cops are bastards you remember that that is like the prime example of if you say all anything are anything you're you're really going to lead yourself off course but a lot of the times through anger and emotion and stuff and searching for bias like let's say you see someone treated unfairly by police now all of a sudden you want to cast a light on police that like i witness police brutality so that means all cops are evil that's just as damaging so we have to come back to these ideas that like there are good and bad people there are biases that exist in the world 
can we do things to make it a better, more you know, conducive, healthy society without going off the Because you can easily go off the rails in search of empathy, in search of virtue, in search of doing the right thing mm-hmm. and, and go down incredibly bad paths. You know? So you probably witness this in, under a lens in so many of the campaigns you're doing. And in education, this is a huge struggle because you have the next gen- generation of children that their thoughts and ideas are going to be shaped you know, by their parents, but really by the education system and culture on how they view the world. So what an important job. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about with what you're doing now. We'll kind of, you know, move your story to this point. What are the huge focal points of your career? Are there any campaigns that you're a part of right now that you're really invested in? Are there, what are like the main issues that you're tackling or like, and also maybe what are the main issues you're seeing from people? Because to have a campaign, you have to have some target. Right. So we work with schools around the world, which is um, very exciting and very interesting. So all the way from pre-K through university. So it depended on, and and we're very lucky in the position we have with my agency of being able to choose the projects that we want to work on. So sometimes we might get an organization or a school district or a school or university that comes to us and says, you know, we, we would like to work with you. But again, going back to what I was originally talking about in PR, if, if it's not doesn't feel right, I'm not going to do a great job for you. And I have no problem saying that to a client uh, or a potential client to say, you know what, I so appreciate that. Thank you so much for coming for us. But you might want to try this agency. I think they might be a little bit of a better fit um, for you. Or we don't, we're not taking on anybody at this time. Well, and time. that's that authenticity. You're like, I want to believe in the cause that I'm going to support. Yeah, and we have some, and you know, and that even hurts with recruiting, you know, talent recruiting and things. Sometimes, you know, some of the districts that, that we've worked with, I've had people say, why? Well, I know that you work with this district, and I heard that their board just got into a big fight and was all over TV, and I don't think I could do that. And I said, that's fine. I completely respect that. To me, it's not about the adults. It's about, I always in my mind have the focus on, for some reason, I just have it stuck in my head. And, I, and maybe it's, you know, I've done, I do so many school visits and I don't know if I've ever even seen this child, but I just have this picture of like a seven-year-old, like third grader, you know, he's sitting in the, in the classroom and that's kind of his refuge from whatever might be going on in his life. And for my, I just keep that in mind, particularly with some of the clients that, that we work with, because it's not about the adults, right? I mean, we can be silly as adults and we let things, personal opinions and things get in the way. That child doesn't have a choice. The child is in that, in that school. And so we need to recruit the best talent to be able to teach that child. We need to recruit um, funding, you know, depending on where it is, or we need to get that funding. We need to convince lawmakers or policymakers that this school or this district matters. Uh, and we need to let the general public know, like, about the great things that are happening. And that's been the hardest thing over the last two years or two and a half years since the pandemic is shifting the mindset of everything in education is bad um, to where there actually there are a lot of bright spots there. And so, you know, kind of going back to what you're saying about about biases and prejudice when we say you know like all public schools are bad or all charter schools are bad or only rich kids can go to private schools or whatever the case is we're not really looking and it's not a fair shake to those teachers or the staff or the administrators who are trying so hard behind the scenes to make things right like maybe there was a bad teacher we've all had we've all had some kind of crappy teacher at some point I'm sure right We've all had phenomenal teachers, and and I always go back to like my seventh, eighth grade teacher, who was also the PE teacher, and I'm gonna probably cry because he passed away at the end of April, and we still talk about him and about how formative he was in so many of our of our lives, and you you don't forget people like that, and everybody's had at least one of those, and and if they're saying they're not, they just have to dig a little bit harder and thinking about maybe you know I had a high school enriched English teacher, and he challenged me every class, every class we butted heads, and he'd. I mean, I look back at my high school writing, and it was way, much, much better than what I put out now. And I look back at papers my mom still kept them where he, like, marked up red all over. And, like, and I'm thinking there would, I would not be where I was today or where I am today if it wasn't for him. But, man, we butted heads every classroom or every class. So if you told me, you know, two years outside of, outside of high school, like, Probably, that was probably one of the best teachers you've ever had or will ever have in your life. I'd be like, oh, you know. let's let's break that down. Was it because he was demanding excellence from you? Even oh. like why why was it that you know you, it was good enough? He easily could have been a teacher that just marked it as oh yeah that's acceptable. Yeah. 
But what was it really about him that was special? Was it that was it that he saw more in you and was demanding excellence? What was that? Um, it was definitely with the excellence. So if you were in this program, you either tested in with like the the high IQ in in English uh, language, or you were getting consistently like over hundreds in in class. Which back in Canada was very rare. We had eighty to hundred was an A. Um, and still to this day, I still think it was harder to get an A then than maybe even in my my doctorate, which was ninety three to a hundred. Um, but he, you know, so to be in the program in the first place, you know that you're already somewhat special and you're good at what you do. But then when, you know, he's challenged and a lot of it was in-depth thinking, um, led, led the pathway to, you know, the researcher that I am today. But, you know, we would do things like um, we'd read a book, you know, with Joseph Conrad. I, I can't, remember, can't think of it off the top of my head. But then, you know, there was a movie adaption made to it. And so then analyzing the differences between a book and a movie. And then, you know, I did remember like my senior project was on the soundtrack, you know, like the, the what what actually why the words were chosen. And so he always pushed us to go further. But it wasn't, you know, we were all pretty great at what we did. It's kind of like going into a college coach and all of a sudden to be told that you're not that special because everybody else there is there and he knows that you can do better. And same thing as your college coach. You know, he knows what you ran, you know, in the hundred. He know he knows you can be faster. Why were you why were you lazy on the field? Or why'd you let that person get around from you? Or or why'd you you know, in tennis my big thing was I could outlast any opponent. You know, if a match went three hours, it was gonna be me in it. And if the girl was six feet tall, I'm five two, you know, if she's six feet tall, um, it's probably gonna be me playing her, but I would probably outlast her on the court. But if I wasn't that day, the coach would call you out on it. So I think it's that that excellence but also like they had no problem and it's probably why I'm very blunt now and even just like you didn't do the work did you you didn't do the reading did you you know it's a sense of embarrassment I think especially as a teenager and you're in this class with everybody who's top notch in this program you know you couldn't register you had to be asked to be in the program and and that was it and so you know you never wanted to get called out that's exactly what I was looking for was that you even though and because I see this even with my athletes they don't like being pushed until later on like when you really push someone for excellence you really push them to give more you you tell them that they that was 90 percent of their effort not a hundred and you push 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 at the time it's like get off me they're like that is good i i did good enough like you're picking on me you're but later on they see that as like man that is actually what a good mentor coach guide or someone should do they should almost make you a little bit uncomfortable in the way that like there's even better in there yeah. You know what I mean? And it's that it's that that type of relationship that now you're able to probably be like that with your children. You're able to call your children out and tell them that you can do better than what you did because you see that over a long period of time that is really healthy for you. In some cases, too, you know, so I think as a as an agency owner and a team leader, I, I can I know and I can help mentor anybody who's worked for me with that. Um, with the kids, I I think with me seeing also the negative of I've also dealt with a lot of student suicides from the PR perspective. I've dealt with, you know, situations that could have been much, 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 much worse on the administrative side. So I've seen a lot of things and been privy to a lot of things that the general public wouldn't or parents wouldn't. So there's this very fine, cautious line that that I draw as a mother because I also am very aware of student mental health and our kids are really young and, you know, haven't had to go through that yet, but that's not to say, you know, I always say you just never know what's going to happen. So you can't sit, sit there and cast stones because you don't know if your kid is going to, you know, go that route. You have no idea. What do you mean? What route? Um, I think, you know, if they're under too much pressure, you know, do they have, I've seen kids have breakdowns. I've seen, you know, like I said, I've, I've dealt with student suicides as, as young as 11 years old. Um, from the PR perspective, and sometimes things go without warning, or a kid's expelled because of a threat that they've made, and no warning from behind it. So you just, you kind of can't say that it's never going to happen and turn a blind eye. And so I think, I think I run a, almost a very cautious route as a parent because I know that they can be excellent in some areas, but then I also get too concerned sometimes about I don't want to push too hard. Yeah, and that's probably the love and empathy of a mother too. I mean, your your children are your world, right? Oh, absolutely. Like, so yeah. to get past that emotion and really, like, from a psychiatric standpoint, be like, what is the healthiest way to develop this person while encouraging them to improve their resiliency? Because this life is going to be rough. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And the oh, yeah. less the Absolutely. less you have it in your character, the rougher the life is going to be. Yep. Right? And your ability to adapt to change and deal with very difficult situations, like it's going to be difficult. But it's like y- there's that fine line to float. Why do you think mental health has deteriorated so bad for students across the nation? When we were younger, there were definitely people that struggled. But like if you talk to almost, if we went out and interviewed 50 random students, I bet you 90% of them will diagnose themselves with anxiety to the point where they can barely function. They don't, some kids can't make a phone call. They're so terrified. Why has the mental health of the nation gone to nothing? You're someone that has a very inside look. So I remember when I was working at a private school in 2005 and the head of school started circulating articles coming about helicopter parents. And it was a new term back then, which now, you know, was tiger mom or helicopter parent is, is almost kind of common. I haven't and, heard of helicopter parent. Yeah. Until now. And so it was basically where a parent wouldn't let their child fail. So if a child got a B on a test, instead of going to the child saying, you know, did you study, study, did you study enough? Did you do your homework? Like what happened here? The automatic response was to go to the teachers. Why, why did Johnny get a, a B on the test? And so that was the terminology that started to come out or you know, if they didn't make the sports team, it was either going to the coach to complain or they, if they were on the basketball team, they make their kids stay out till 10 o'clock at night because they wanted their kid to be the star. And that's obviously not every parent, but it was a, a somewhat a new term that started to kind of circulate around there that we needed to be aware of. And I think that there, is, there, there are a lot of people who don't want to see their kids fail. I don't want to see my kids fail. You never Nobody want does, to. I don't think. However, you it's know, important, though. you talked about resilience, right? And especially if they're not getting it. Like my kids, my kids are involved more in like the arts than they are in the sports, which, you know, we talked about, I've had four knee surgeries, so I'm not too, too sad about thinking about how I can hardly move now in my, <laughs> my mid 40s. Plus you want them to follow their passion. But I want them to be passion. happy. Yeah. If, they, if they're doing it, then, then that's great. And I, want, I just want them to be passionate about something, you know, whatever it is. But we look at it as sometimes like we can't allow them to fail, you know, like go back to, we talked about it earlier, Coach Codwell said, okay, your hand hurts. Okay, well, you feel better now? I'm Well, you're injured. You're on the injury list the rest of the game. And you just go. It's a good life lesson. Yeah, and, and I don't think we get that. I mean, I coached my daughters, my six, she was six at the time, a rec league, her soccer league this year. And it was such a rec league that not only did we not keep track of wins and losses, we didn't keep track of score during the game. And I thought, this is great. She's never played soccer. You know, she plays in the backyard with me, and she's great. You know, let's let's get out there. And it was six to eight-year-olds, and you had a whole bunch of eight-year-olds who had been playing the league for three years already, their third year. And the parents are yelling at them, and they're, you know, on, I couldn't like I couldn't believe it. And, you know, the first the first game, at our timeout, and I called the team over, and you had several parents who called their kids over to them on the sidelines trying to tell them what to do. So and that's that's what a helicopter pilot is. Or, helicopter sorry, helicopter parent. parent yeah, is it's the, part of it and just like overreaching, I know, I know better. I know I'm better. Not, yeah. yeah, I'm not going to let the coach play their role. I'm not going to let, I'm going to blame other people for failing. Yeah. yeah, and you just hear, like, I remember my, my husband was sitting on the sideline. He's like, yeah, you know, so-and-so's dad was like, you get that ball, you just go with it, you don't pass. Like, it's, and I'm like, we're in a rec league. Like, these kids are. Was this it, around here? There was yeah. a league that wasn't keeping score? And what, oh, I thought yeah. that was only yeah, like. Yeah, like the rec, the community, a lot of the community rec leagues will do that in the, in the What's different the purpose areas. of not keeping score in a, in it just a sports to get them, game? It's just to get any kid that might be interested in playing you know, to just be able to learn the foundation because they're so little, especially something like soccer. Yeah. Soccer is a very strategic sport. And when you're trying to get, I used to coach when I was a teenager, you try to like get 11, 11 kids to go like when they're not just following the butterfly or they're all going to And there's daisies the in the field. And it's just like, you know, you just want them to get there. And then if they're interested, they at the same age, you could play in a different league where they kept score. Or you could try out for the travel team or they're the multiple things. So this was really, you know, a league like, Hey, you haven't played. You need to get some exercise. You want to try it out before you try out for, you know, a travel team. Like you can come play in this league. But it almost seems like at the very beginning of your story, you said people are afraid to let their kids fail. Then you said we're not letting keeping score or doing anything like this because we don't want the kid to feel like he's failing. When really, if you want to find out if you want to play soccer and you go out in the field and you're not good yet, how do you get better? You get better by training. You get better by practicing. You get better in every game, in any legitimate thing. They're going to keep score. And you're going to oh, know who wins and loses. Absolutely. But you're almost setting the standard to, to that soft, like, well, we're not going to let them fail here. Where that's setting an unrealistic foundation based on the original statement of, like, 
you got to let your, like, if you're not good in the beginning, that's how most people are at everything. Like when you first oh, yeah. start a new skill, you're just usually oh, not very good. Right. I mean, the kids know. I mean, we kept track. We're like, we're undefeated. That's you know, what I mean. Course. Like, you know, so but, then there's but like. The parents are like some, some parents are crazy with it. And I had a couple that criticized and a couple of out of shape dads at one point. I remember saying something to me and I said, I played college soccer. Would you like to come coach next week? And they were just like, oh, you know, and it was like one dad's like, you know, I, I played high school, I played high school soccer. I could probably show you a couple things. And I said, well, that's fine. I played college soccer. We won, you know, a conference championship and we're ranked in the country. Would, would you like to come be my assistant coach next week? Like, don't matter. Like when I think when you're an athlete, the, the drive to compete is never not it's there. It's never gone. But I think with those kids, I wanted to foster an understanding of the sport more so than let's kick the ball and try to win. Like the understanding is I played two distinct sports for a reason, right? I actually played multiple sports all the way through high school, but I stuck with two. At the tennis, which is fully on you. Sure. You don't show up, you don't Personal train, responsibility and you do not, and tennis is full on mental sport. That is, and once something gets in your head, it's it is screws with you so bad, you can't get it out. Well, Soccer. especially the one-on-one element. You are standing across the tennis court Absolutely. from one other person. If you're playing soccer and this person doesn't play that well or your goalie lets a couple balls in, you can kind of let yourself off the hook a little bit. You'll be like, oh, I played well. But in tennis, it's you against them. Absolutely. Which is similar to like in combat. We walk into a ring. Someone shuts the door and someone's going to get physically beaten to the yeah. point where they cannot continue <laughs> Or they get finished. There's no real fingers to point. No. It's all on you. All on so you. that that type of resiliency that you have to have is like if you fail your tennis match, it's your fault. Yeah. Now you might be able to get better training. You might right. be able to get better coaching. But you have that relationship to like I need to do better. Now that oh, might absolutely. be different. Might be different environments or things like that. But I've always struggled with the understanding of like of not like we have this weird sense of wanting to protect people but we're actually giving them unrealistic expectations about what life is going to be like and what sports are going to be like. Because as mm-hmm. soon as you get in anything legitimate, like all the way, did you ever play in a league that didn't keep score? Ever? No. No. I actually didn't know. V- so, and then, you know, I was trying not to get the kids all riled up in the back of my head. I'm like, if we win this one, we're going to undefeated. Yeah. Like, no, in my mind, I would be doing the same thing. I'd be like, <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys are doing great. And plus, how do you really compliment your team or show the kids that are working? Ex- Let's say you have a couple kids on the field mm-hmm. that are working super hard. They're playing the game. They're setting great passes. They're getting tap-ins and they're scoring. And But like, oh, we're not keeping score. We don't, like, it, it's still, almost undermining trying to get well, a kid to be better. I think and it's, it's also leadership skills, right? So you look at the, you know, if you have Jenny over here who's scoring the goals and we're, we're a co-ed team, and you compliment and you say, this is so phenomenal. And we, I always, just like Coach Cowell did with us, we all switch positions. You play forward for a little bit. You play, there are no goalies. No, I think that's a great a idea. And and you say to that that kid, and they understand at the age, as long as they don't have the parent in their ear yelling at them to take the ball and just go off on their own, when I say, okay, Jenny, I'm going to team you with Jimmy, this is his first year playing, because we, we had a little boy who was very scared about going in the field. He was the sweetest thing, and I said, you two – get along while practice. I'm going to pair you two on defense, but I need you to, to help him. But you let, if the ball comes to him, you know what to, you know what to do. You just support him and you go behind. So it's l- teaching them a little bit more strategy and teamwork and understanding that, yes, you might be the best at that, but you also have to support your teammates. So you're only as good as your worst player. No, I right? think that's a great idea, especially like you're not in an age where, like you said, you're really playing at a high level yet. Now, Ex- if we were travel, that'd yeah. be different. If we were six to eight, even six sure. to eight year olds travel, and we're not playing well, let's admit it, right? Like, you're on a travel team. You've committed to this. You know, mom and dad didn't or grandma didn't sign you up for this just to kick around the ball for an hour on a Saturday. You're on travel. 100%. So if you're not playing your position, you're, you're benched. That's just how, how yeah, it's going to go. Yeah, for sure. But, like, when you were an athlete and you saw another athlete doing really well, like, do you ever have someone on your team and you're like, wow, they're really good? Oh, That's, yeah. like, an inspirational thing. That's, Absolutely. like, I'm going to get better. Absolutely. I'm going to level up. So it's, like, we can we can see those kids that are doing really well and then encourage other kids that, like, hey, if you practice and you work on your ball skills and you're taking care of yourself and you're learning the game, like, you can be great, too. So it's, like, a nice path to maybe that kid with no self-esteem that barely stepped out on the field. You can lay out to them, like, hey – we can get you to improve, you know, but right now it's okay to not be good. It's okay if you get scored on. It's okay if you lose the game. You know what I mean? And I think also, I think some, some parents are also in some aspect afraid of failure for their kids. So yeah, that was like where this all started. Well, and I the- think in some cases, you know, I had a couple kids that should have been playing travel. 
they were phenomenal. They were great. And you could see the potential. You could see the fire. So I'd say the parents, you know, after the game, you know, I know. Your kid such belongs so at good, this level. But you're, you know, you got it. And the, the way that their faces lit up, just even like the mention that they think that me, like the rec coach, it's no different than when the, the rec coaches said to my parents back when I was 10, like, you need to get lessons. It's kind of like wow, I didn't know, because they don't know what they don't know, right? Especially if it's their oldest kid, they've never been through it. They weren't athletes themselves, or they didn't play at a high level. Absolutely. They don't know what to they really look for. They don't know what for. to expect, or maybe they, they know, you know, Johnny down the street like is in travel, and they're kind of psycho, and they're gone every weekend, and they don't want to have anything to do with it. But when you tell them, like, hey, there are four travel teams in this area, I really think that next season perhaps you should take a look at that, because I think that your child has what it takes. They're obviously way better than in the rec league, but they also have that passion because when they show up to practice, they're there a hundred percent. Like they're always at, you know, they're always driven at practice. They're not fooling around. And with six to eight year olds, when they're not fooling around, that's a pretty good sign that they're into the sport, right? When they're not worried about the bunny that's hopping over there or their friend that's, you know, you know, using the, like make an armpit toots, you know, or anything like that. Like they're, they're paying attention. They're there. And so that's, I think you can recognize that pretty quickly. So you, you initially started with the mental health crisis with, you think it's a lot coming from the parents, a lot mm-hmm. coming from the pressures and stuff that are put on the children. And that's, what's causing people to be so, uh, I think that's part of it. I think the, it's definitely you know, multifaceted. There's I a lot of social things. media. I mean, that could be a whole conversation for a different day. Lack of authenticity from people. Again, these are these perfect lives that everyone else is living, and look at your life. It's full of very I cannot, mundane. I cannot imagine if social media was around when I was in high school or, or college even. You know, um, I was bullied. I can only imagine if I had had somebody on social media telling me, you know, go kill yourself or, you know, go do this or nobody likes you or you've lost all your friends. Like, I can't even fathom what – these students and and young people go through now I your can't bullying even, wasn't like that it was just it was like more to the you know kind of face or behind the back rumors or things you know like like things like that because i remember in the 90s and i mean the early 2000s bullying was people were ruthless oh the yeah the words that are said now aren't even i mean they were ruthless yeah. and now it's a different form of bullying now when yeah. you have everybody all connected and it you know it can reach or a lot of people or i mean for just, sure just the ridiculous but i remember bullying was definitely a problem i mean people were ru- i had t- multiple suicides in my class I, yeah you know it, it yep. was ruthless yep. yeah and, and and now they're doing it from behind a screen right or you hear about catfishing or i mean the stuff that goes on there is is ridiculous and then i think also part of it is you know, and, and I grew up in a different education system than over here. And, and it really depends on where you're at or what kind of environment you are for school. Because if you're at a certain school to go to, say, a community college after you graduate, it's kind of like, oh, you, which to me is absolutely asinine and ridiculous. For sure. Um, but the, the expectations, the judgments the that will come from, is, yeah. It's absolutely, absolutely ridiculous. And, and perhaps part of it is, you know, my, my dad was in the trades and my mom was a, a criminal intelligence analyst and we lived a phenomenal life. My brother's in the trades, lives a phenomenal life. I grew up in an area where people want to get their doctorates. People went into the trades. People started their own businesses. And guess what? Everybody's still friends, you know, like, and I don't think it's like that any, uh, in a lot of places anymore. It's very, it's like uber competitive and it's, if you're not on this path, then you're wrong. Whatever that path might be, depending on the school or, or the city or the environment that they're in, if they're not on that path, if they're even a little tiny bit outside that path, it's wrong. I agree a thousand percent. And I think that's where we really have to look at in a world that's so dynamic with all the pressures that people face. How do you really build the self-confidence and stuff of a child? Because this world is going to hit them with so many things that we did not have to deal with. And like mm-hmm. you said, just your area. Like I used to volunteer down in Detroit schools and I would teach martial arts there on the weekends. It was called uh, Martial Arts in the D. And I, it was actually sponsored by the UAW. I would go down, the former VP and me set it up of, of the Ford UAW. And we would go down and work with the kids down there. And then like the culture and what those kids grow up experiencing is so vastly different but it's weird I looked at education funding and stuff for the inner city because I'm like man are they just not the funding is there and there's many other things that are and people always say like we need more funding 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 but the I mean I was talking to the security guard one time after one of the classes I'm like man tell me about like what what does a normal day look like here at school he's like I pull guns out of cereal boxes from sixth graders He's like, that's a true story. Like there will people come in, they'll have a cereal box in their backpack. I'll open it up and there'll be a nine millimeter inside. And that's like a part of their life. And I'm like, 
that is unbelievable. Imagine, you know, what drives a child, because you're a child at that point, you barely have a formed brain to think and act like this. And we come from a different position where, you know, I mean, I wasn't right. My parents were no means like successful. Neither of my parents went to college and, you know, like I kind of built myself through a lot of tragedy that I won't go into, but, um, but the different levels of education and the different resources that people get are, are shocking. And I can't really put a finger on why that problem exists. If everyone's aware that it exists, like we all know that issues there. We all know, and you're someone that's really deeply involved in education, but yet it doesn't change. It's, it's, I mean, maybe things have gotten slightly better, but not much. I was just down in Detroit not too long ago, and it's not much better. Do you see, I guess the question I'm trying to ask is, do you see a pathway forward where we can fix a lot of these things to make it better for those kids? Yeah, so I work with a lot of um, urban school districts, also work with private schools. So I see the full spectrum. I know a lot about school funding in Michigan. Um, if anybody's listening and interested, the School Finance Research Collaborative is a really excellent source because, yes, maybe Detroit might get, say, the same funding as Brighton, yeah. perhaps, per pupil. However, if 15% of the students don't show up on count day, that means that that's less funding per student. Or in the case of where my husband um, is from in the UP, as it was always explained to me when I was studying school finance, they maybe get the same amount of money, but they've got to run diesel buses. And this is before the gas, you know, but we were talking about before the, the gas hike. But instead of all the money going into the classroom, they have to run buses that have to go pick up kids 50 minutes or 50 miles away. And all that money comes out of the same pot. Sure. Or they've got to feed more, maybe it's feeding more kids that, you know, a lot of the districts and schools that we work with are 100% um, school meals, meaning that it's low income or Title IX to where these students' families fall at such a rate that they get, they qualify for free and reduced lunches, perhaps even breakfast. So if that district gets the same amount of money as another district, but another district's in a more affluent place where perhaps only 20 or 30% of the students qualify for that, all that money has to come out of the same pot. So you believe it's just funding that's causing these issues or well, a large I factor? A, I think it's a big I think it's a big factor because people don't realize it when they go to vote, you know, or 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 you have people that are trying to put different policies in place. So I think there is a big factor there. I think there's also a perception factor. I think um, retention and engagement in some schools we're seeing right now is a is a massive shortage. I still can't wrap my head around it. You know, coming from Canada, being a teacher is a very noble profession. Um, it's hard to become a teacher. You go to school and you've got to get accepted in teacher's college or a master's degree. And like, I don't know, I just grew up with a lot of friends who became teachers. And when parents all run into each other after and they say, oh, you know, what does, what does Jane do? Oh, Jane's a high school history teacher. Wow. That's amazing. You know, where is she teaching at? Oh, wow. She said that. That's great. It's all public ed. Right. Whereas you come over here in the, in the U S and it's almost like this perception of teaching and and I think it's reflected in teacher salaries it's reflected in what's expected of teachers now it's reflected in even how um, districts and even private schools spend the money right so that's I a think, great point I mean we definitely va- value teachers less than what we did even when I was growing up and and I'll tell the opposite story as you a lot of people that I grew up with that became teachers now I can't believe they're teachers these were people that were not making good decisions not I mean, I, uh, but sometimes those and, make and, the best. No, teachers. sure. Absolutely. <laughs> and they can get better. But like, let's say I can see their life through an outside lens and you're like, those are the people that are going to educate my children. That's kind of horrifying. Maybe because our shift in teachers hasn't brought like what you want is that a teaching role in society should be an incredibly crucial, important aspect of a nation. Like you're going to raise and shape the minds of the next generation that are going to go out and hopefully make the world better than what we've given it to them. You know what I mean? So you want the teachers to be a very prestigious thing. Now, like we almost view teachers in a very like eh, light very often that isn't going to drive the cream of the crop or the people that really could give unbelievable hearts and lessons to these children to wanting to pursue that profession. And it's actually being mirrored in police as well. Who in the world would want to be a police officer right now? 
with the amount of hate that's out there and the amount of yeah, eyes my, that are on them. My seven-year-old just told me she wants to be a police officer <laughs> the other day. So when I come and you from, probably I come, had a heart attack. Well, I come from a police family, so I oh, know a lot of that. So, so. imagine, but if, if yeah. the cultural lens shifts at the way that they view anything, a teacher, an officer, anything like that, it's going to drive different people into those professions. We almost have to get back to our respect and our appreciation for the people that are giving their lives in the service of kids. Absolutely. I mean, I say, you know, with everything going on in schools, really, who, who would want to be a teacher? You've got parents that are bullying. You've got helicopter parents. Helicopter have. parents. You've got school shootings. You've got less funding. You've got hey, you've got to take mental health crisis. I mean, it's just and... it's just it's just insane. In fact, you know, when the pandemic first hit, I'd say to client schools, I'm like, you need to take a picture of your third grade if your third grade teacher will allow it, because I know she's got you know three kids at home. I want you to take a picture, have her, have somebody at home snap a picture of her trying to teach an online class with her three kids around her at the kitchen table, trying to help them online. It's a moment of history. And I tell you, you know, any of the clients that did that, the social media rumors and the criticism all but stopped because it was like, oh, yeah, I guess, I guess she is a person too. Like she does have like. Wait, you have a life outside of just Wait, teaching my kids? Too? You're just a human being like me? Absolutely. So it's, again, getting into what are those stories? Like, where are those bright spots? Because not only do those stories help bring brand awareness and, and recognition, those areas that are bright spots, and maybe some districts or schools, maybe they only have, like, three bright spots. You don't know. But you know what? That just – I'm a firm believer in karma and good news and positivity just breeds positivity. When you bring that light on, the morale boost – engagement boost and I could tell you from any school or university I've ever worked at in my entire career there's always been somebody who's never wanted to work with me because it's PR they don't get what we do we think they think they're flighty and I have one professor that I worked with years and years and years ago he canceled 18 meetings with me and I had can I kept a track on a, on a post in my office and then finally when everybody else was getting more press and media mentions and attention on their program came running my office like what are you going to do for our program you're not doing anything like happy to be happy to meet with you when would you like to meet so it's this domino effect right so you have a lot of times especially in higher ed you have um, a lot of professors particularly if they're on a tenure track or something like that that need the the press and they need to talk about the great work that they're doing Uh, maybe it's funding but teachers aren't getting into teaching to be celebrities right so when you go and I and I say to a teacher and it's still part of that, that whole wavy thought process, that, that windy road, when I say, you know, I heard that you're doing this really innovative way of, you know, teaching students Spanish in your class. Can we, you know, take some pictures, interview for it? And nine and a half times out of ten, it's, well, I'm, I'm not doing anything special. I'm just doing my job. But to somebody on the outside, we see this as, you know, even 20 years of working now in education with schools around the world, I can recognize things that are really unique and really different. And I say, this is a potentially great story. Like we just did one with um, a school in Houston where a young lady was taught entrepreneurial skills and after school program for at risk students. And she got her hairdresser, stood her up, her braider. And so she had to learn how to braid her hair for a date that night. And she said it was horribly sloppy. But then she was like, well, why am I paying all this money to somebody who can't even, you know, keep their appointments with me? So she kept learning how to to braid. And then one of her teachers at the school, the high school, saw what she was doing. And she was in the after school program. So they started to teach her how to run her own business. And now that business, you know, we've gotten her on the television news and interviews and potentially national press we're working on right now. And that business is going to pay for her college. So, you know, you find these little tiny bright spots. Like diamonds in the rough. And that you are have to there. kind of focus on it because then we'll, what will happen is that other good stories will start to come out, right? And you see this if, you, if, if your child is in a school district, you might hear about how one school is the best school in the district. Well, no, it's, it's, it might be in some cases. However, that's all part of it, right? So if we promote the school and we promote the great stories, what's going to naturally happen? People are going to want to send their kids People are going to want to send their track. People are going to have, the students are going to start to believe it. The teachers and staff will believe it. They've seen it, but maybe their morale is in the gutter because they've been told that they're the worst school in the district or the worst school in the area. But once you start to get that story, it's just like a, a snowball effect. And it doesn't cure. It's not a be-all and end-all because there's a lot that you know needs to be fixed in different areas of education. But I think that's a great start. So here's an area that I would like to be able to put on the podcast because I think we'll be able to clip this and use this as a as a resource tool because um, we have a couple of people in here with a couple hundred thousand followers, people that fight on ESPN, Fox Sports. 
what do you think are the biggest areas of focus that our current education system needs or that you're trying to bring awareness to or like the difficult things that the average parent at home is not considering? You know what I'm saying? To, to basically get them to be more engaged to a certain thing that needs attention. What, would, what do you think are the most crucial areas? So we work with a lot of um, really great public school districts that have phenomenal leaders that are, are that are trying to change things or different programs, right? Recognizing the arts, you know, which probably when you and I went to school to, you know, if, if a kid told I their did parent, painting and all kinds of know, stuff in school, but, and if their but if their kid was going to tell their parent, like I, I got accepted into an arts program for the gifted, I'd probably be like, get back to stats class. Right. 100%. And so they're recognizing now, like the whole child needs to be educated in components. Um, I have one private school client in particular, it's called, um, exceed preparatory Academy down in Florida. And it was founded by a former public school teacher whose parents were both in education. His mom owned early childhood learning centers. Dad was a dean of education at a school in Florida. Um, And he was just like, the one thing he always says was that what turned him off initially from teaching was that he worked at um, a lower income school. And the first day of school, they had students labeled. And it was students labeled, well, these are the troubled kids. These are the low performing kids. These are kids that aren't good at math. And he said, so you're just going to tell me like first day of school, like these are the kids to avoid or these are the kids that are going to struggle in my class versus yeah, letting like, me figure why, it out. Why are you telling me that? And so he went on to, to found, found a couple of different private schools and the one that he does now, um, they, they operate on, on a hybrid flexible model, recognizing like, like for example, elite athletes would be phenomenal for this because they serve a lot of elite athletes. They're in Florida. Maybe a tennis player is not going to, they're not going to train at two o'clock in the afternoon in Florida, right? It's too hot. So they're going to train at from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. And then to be able to come into school and work on a flexible schedule that meets their needs and where they're not penalized for, oh, I've got to go Thursday through Sunday. I'm a term in California, so I've got to miss school. Whereas in their other education system, if they miss the class, they were screwed, right? And so his whole focus is on subject mastery, not time and seats, because he always says, and I, and I absolutely love his philosophy, and as somebody who's got a doctor in education, it was the first time it actually made sense to me, right? So I was never a good learner in class. Like, I had to, like, learn different ways, whether it was I would record my notes on tape and listen to them at night and then reread. And I always highlight anybody that got a textbook after me was in big trouble because everything was highlighted because I just had to, like, follow along while I read. And so recognizing that students learn differently and appreciating that and understanding that um, you know, just because you're there in class doesn't mean that you're actually learning the material. So at that school, for example, and I'm not, this is not necessarily a promo for them, but it is wonderful. My, my daughter keeps saying, one of my daughters, like, I wish I could go to a school like that. But if, if it takes a student eight weeks, eight weeks to master a subject, right, which typical semester is 13 to 14 weeks, then that student can move on to the next class. If it takes a student 18 weeks to master that subject, that's fine. There's no like, oh, you didn't pass that class or, oh, you're behind the rest of the class. It just, maybe that student had other circumstances that, you know, they've had students there that work full time in high school to support families while they're, while they're going to school or when they got a scholarship to go there or students who are performing arts or students, you know, children of celebrities or something that had to travel or families that just wanted to spend more time together, which we saw in the pandemic that, hey, we're going to take an RV trip across the country. So we're going to be gone for six months. Can they check in online? Absolutely. So I think that there's some components where the time and seats is does not equal. I think, you know, and Dr. Brent Goldman, like, he, he coined it. I'm not trying to claim it, but time and seats does not equal subject mastery, but there's also a fine line with subject mastery and te- like over testing. And I think there are, there are different things. It makes me very sad to see when districts cut. Um, I, I always get, I always get fired up when they'll say specials, right? So PE, arts, music, um, foreign language, library, tech, they're always considered specials, right? And in my mind, those are essentials. Yeah, those are called lighting up your spirit so you're not just a drone <laughs> cramming and, information in your mind. They're important. students are going to find different things that they like 100%. or different ways to learn. Maybe. And you know what we admire? Amazing artists, amazing musicians, amazing Absolutely. athletes. Ama- we admire these things, so you can't steal that from them. Yeah, it makes me, it makes me crazy when, when schools or districts say, oh, they've got specials. And, and I say, no, those are essentials. So when school funding has to start to cut those, um, that just gets me 
gets me absolutely fired up. Um, you know, obviously somebody's athlete, you know, PE was great, but when we got into high school, we started learning anatomy and, and physiology and things like that as part of our physical education, right? It's not gym class, it's physical education. You learn nutrition, you learn how to, you know, you learn some recipes when you go off to college, you can cook. And that's why I think I'm so passionate about career tech ed is my favorite area to work in because I think every student should take some kind of career technical education course. No ifs, ands, or buts. And I'm, and I'm working, if, it's, if this I, I bank the rest of my career on, of getting rid of the stigma of a student going to a career tech ed campus, or they call it voc tech, or those kids, or whatever, the, it just drives me so batty. Because as somebody who is a daughter of a, of a tradesman who lived a very wonderful childhood, um, you know, I see how well the trades can be. But I've also seen kids go and take a robotics class there, and because they're able to focus four hours a day, four to five days a week, go on full scholarships for engineering programs. Um, I've seen students, many students, they go on to nursing or go on to be surgeons or doctors by taking health science, these, these specialized courses. But it's still a stigma because if they're not an AP class, then they're not going to get into university. And I just, and I call BS on that. No, I think what you just said is so spot on. I mean, and honestly, when you were saying a lot of what the doc, that doctor had wrote in reference, it's almost logical. Like I'm a martial arts coach. People don't learn at the same level. They don't learn under the same way. Some people have to do things by themselves over and over. Some people are visual learners. Some people have unbelievable retention. Some people have to drill things until the point where it's just second nature. And to kind of box everybody into one model, it's honestly, it's just probably the most convenient way to do it. It's just like we're all just going to, you know, stick is, okay, this is the maximum classroom size. Here's how long we're going to do the program for. It doesn't matter if you're excelling or if you're behind. Like, we're just going to kind of do this. And it's almost like the cheap way, the lack of really investing in what is a – there's no perfect, but what is a – better version of education look like in this society and this culture and how do we pursue it what you're describing i can't see any logical person with the ability to critically think being like that would be bad you would right. you would be so it would be such a better environment that would be conducive for each person growing and feeling better about themselves and being challenged and pushed but but not having to meet some standard that for them is unrealistic. Like maybe you and I, like I learned things incredibly fast. I grew up in all AP classes. I was tested for the John Hopkins program. I was, so I learned things incredibly fast. But to sit me in a room and say, okay, at this period you're going to learn the same as th this person, that is incredibly unfair if someone doesn't have the same gifts. And it's limiting to me too. Because if you're holding me to a lower standard, or not lower, I don't even mean to say it that way, because maybe in another field, they might be so far beyond where I am. We're all on a varying scale, right? So how do we get education boards and people to do this? Well, it's through storytelling. It's through getting people to see these examples of success and go, wait a second, maybe that would be a better way for our community, for our children. It's, it's brilliant. It really is, because the ultimate teaching method in my opinion is like the Socratic method where it's like one-on-one -on -one learning but to do that in a society with 400 million people in this country it's super difficult but if we have these conversations and we start breaking down what are the needs of the children what is damaging the children what is creating unrealistic stress and expectations of them that we could be solving as people that want to help you know what I mean like by giving these people the flexibility the way you said hey we can let the tennis player do their lessons here and still get their education in, that's like, why wouldn't we do that? It's just the only answer is, well, it's never been done that way. Well, as a society that's seeking to be better, we should look at these things and say, if it's going to be better for our kids, it's going to be better for the future, and it's possible, then we should, we should look to make it happen. We have um, a client school in Houston, um, Yes Prep Public School, which is a really phenomenal model. They've got about 17,000 kids. Um, this last year, they and they focus. They've had a very heavy focus on college-bound um, education. Although now they've they've expanded and changed their mission a little bit. But they had 1,620 seniors graduate. 99.1% um, acceptance rate to a college. 90% are first-generation college students. Many come from um, non-English-speaking families. 90%. Or 90%. And so not only do they help prepare them for college, once they go off to college, they have what they call as a college impact program, a college initiatives program, where they, they, the summer before college, they sit with the families and they have like this whole checklist of how to prepare, how the family can prepare together for their child going off to college, whether it's their first child going off or their fifth child going off. 
it's everything from go to college, to go to the campus together as a family and have the youngest in your family pick out a spot on the map for you all to find together. Like these, it's just brilliant. And then once they get to college, they're doing it in a couple of weeks, they're doing send offs from all the campuses, all the different high schools. So it's a big family. It's very family oriented. And they realize and they've recognized that by bringing the families in, especially when they come from different cultures that really rely on the family units, when they bring the families in and they recognize it's a partnership with families and, and edu- education educators and they respect one another's positions in that you know that's how success happens um and then once the students go off it's not the high school's not done with them and this is not a private school right it's a public school so they're not done with them they follow up they have a whole team that follows up you know james did you do your um you know did you get your financial aid set for next semester don't forget like you have to do that it's and, and I don't know about you, but I didn't fill out financial aid forms until I was doing my doctorate because I was always on scholarship. And I remember sitting there as a 30 something going, are you flipping this? kidding me? Like I've applied for mortgage. I've had my own mortgage. I've got car loans and I can't even figure this stuff out. So how do I, how do you expect a student who perhaps they're, and I've spoken to many students at different school districts we've worked with whose parents don't speak English and maybe the forms aren't accessible. Maybe it's something, that, and maybe they don't have, I've had one student who said, well, we don't have a printer in the house, and my parents immigrated here to give me a better life, and my father passed away unexpectedly, and my mother, I've got to translate everything for her, but who's going to trust a 15-year-old, you know, to translate everything perfectly? So then we had to take the bus to the library to print out the form to fill out because you couldn't fill it out online. And you just sit there and you're like, are you... There's just so many me? hurdles that don't need to be so there many that hurdles. we could be carrying. And people don't understand because they think it's a, a like a, one pill is going to fix all of education. And, you know, you spoke about it earlier about what you hear with some of the students that you've worked with. That's not unusual. Not unusual at all for a lot of the districts that we work with. Or if this, you know, and I have a friend that was very heavy into um, charter school consulting for a long time, which is a bad, you know, considered kind of a bad word here in Michigan. But the way that she explained it to me, she's like, if this, she worked a lot in Chicago, for example, and she said, this charter school did not exist here. These students would have to walk almost two miles through drug houses, gang areas, prostitutes to get to the public school because they don't have buses, because it's in the city. They don't have reliable transportation, so the students have to walk through this. And I remember that one of the Detroit papers did something about this about 18 or 19 years ago, about the route of, stu- of a student had to take to get to their local high school. And it was just like, are you kidding me? So there are so many issues across the board, and equitability is like the number one. You know, what's equitable and what's accessible to students? And I mean, if you can't even you know, have a form for a student whose family doesn't speak English to fill out and they can't even do it online because they do have internet because maybe they have a hotspot from the district, but they've been accepted into a program and they can't print it because they can't afford to have a printer in the house. Like how equitable is that? Sure. Absolutely. So, I mean, these are just barriers to entry that don't really need to exist. And if we put any effort, we can cure these things. We don't need some revolutionary new technology. We don't need some unbelievable new genius to step up. It's like kind of right in front of us that we can make a lot of these changes that would make life better for a tremendous amount of people. Yeah. I mean, and it's a lot, right? Every district, every school, and even a school within a district is going to be so different and have different challenges. I mean, we see it even in our counties, you know, what can vary from one school district to the next in the exact same county is just like, how is this even possible? How is this even possible? Or if I lived one street over, you know, what would my child get that they don't get here or vice versa? What would they be missing out on? And it's, it's, I don't know. It's one of these things like, could it ever be solved? I think a lot of things could be made easier and a lot of things could be met better and streamlined. But I think the first thing is, is that people just have to stop you know, pointing fingers and saying, well, I went to school one, you know, I went to school 30 years ago and this is how we did it here. And I don't understand why they do it, which is a big problem, you know, and, and sometimes it's, there, there are problems maybe within the administrative side or not. But I know, for example, um, my daughter's fifth grade teacher this last year was so phenomenal. And, and she announced her retirement on the last day of school. And I cried because I was hoping my other daughter would have her one day because our oldest going through and getting ready for middle school, you know, this teacher had been a longtime teacher. She'd been through it. She'd seen things. And, you know, as a parent to trust her to do her, not only to do her job, but rely on her and say, okay, we're getting ready for middle school. Like what, like 
it's been a long time since I was a 10 year old girl. I don't remember. In my mind, I was perfect, you know? So like, how do you deal with emotions? And, and they're like a support system for the parents, but that's again, trusting and understanding that there's a partnership. You do your job, I do my job, and we're going to meet in the middle. And I don't think there's a lot of that that's going on. In some cases, it rightfully so. In other cases, it's not not uh, quantified. Yeah, and sometimes problems that are happening in the adult world are spilling down into the children's Absolutely. world. I mean, I'm, that's the elephant in the room, right? Like, there's a lot of things going on in the world right now that are super polarizing, where people are really emotional and they're really angry and they're really upset, and it's kind of raining down into the kids. And like mm-hmm. that, sh- they should almost have like a big bubble from that. Like, you don't have to worry about the world's problems at 10 years old. You don't have to be taking on the emotions of your parents that are combating whatever ideology they don't support. Like. We kind of need to just create a good environment to like, hey, learn to be a functional human being and then like the world's going to have all this stuff in store for you when you get there. Absolutely. I mean, we've seen it with um, some of the school boards, you know, um, we've, we've got a phenomenal public school district client. The school board's been a hot, hot mess. I mean, and you just look at it and it's so unfair like to those administrators that, I mean, I've seen them, I'm there, I've, I've seen it, I've seen the school and I've seen these teachers and any of these, any of these teachers or principals or administrators I've met, I go, I would have no problem sending my kid to this, this school in an urban school district that's losing students, but you have board members that are just like out there for a public show, you know, and just fighting and it's just like, so why would another parent from another district ever look at this or their move to their new move to town ever consider the school district when you have the adults making a hot mess of things and then so many behind so many of the adults behind the scenes who are working so hard and have all of their passion into it but you have people over here that are the the are just kind of ruining the brand and I've had several people say like oh why don't you go you know you've got a doctor in education work with schools you should run for the school board <laughs> like like Oh, you mean to put myself under and my family under fire for every little decision that we make? I'm like, I think not. And I've had several people say, you know, that's unfortunate because you're the type of person that should be on a school board. And I said, I listen, I see the other side of it and I see these threats and I see what goes on. I'm like, no, no interest whatsoever. And you are doing your part. You are supporting the campaign you believe in, and you're going all in on that. So it's like you are making a difference. If you were living a life where you weren't making a difference and there was all these problems right in front of you, you'd probably be more like, okay, how do I step up? But you already know you're doing your part. But we do need good people, good people, to get into positions of you know, elected positions and where you're going to come under fire to support a good future. Because if what's happening a lot now is the political world is so ugly and the school boards are such a mess like just go on youtube that you're going to drive so many good people away from those positions Mm -hmm. well if good people don't fill the positions and good is a varying scale right? right but if good people that are educated that are willing to have difficult conversations and can take constructive criticism and can look for logic in very difficult things aren't willing to step up and go to those you're going to get to what you were referring to earlier people that are just there for a show that are supercharged one way or the other that are just the extremists on both sides are usually never a good thing okay like we need to be competing more of like little differences between good people on how do we you know we both want the same thing like if you're you want a happy you know, family and a successful future for your kids. And hopefully if you have bigger sense of self, you want that for your community and the world, et cetera. Well, then our differences are going to be pretty minor. We may disagree on exactly how we get there and the best methods and we can look at information and research and we can make decisions collectively. But you get like kind of the more extremists when you get everyone all fired up because good people are like, I'm not, I'm not stepping in that realm. I'm not going to have people screaming at me and death threats. And and then then you look at it and the people, we have some clients or these I don't know how they do it. You know, they're working high, like high power jobs or in, and or raising a family and they're putting themselves and their families in those positions. And I have the utmost respect for them because some of these positions are, they have to make, especially over the last two years, very, 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 very tough decisions. And if a school board pays, like someone pay maybe $10 a meeting and the amount of work that goes in, like I've seen those. You're board definitely packets, not doing it for the money. <laughs> you are not doing it for the money. You are not doing it for the money. And but why are them, they like, doing it? Why, why are, why are they, people running for school I, board? I think a lot of them care about what's happening in their own community, right? Their children are going through or their children have gone through and they care about it. Um, other cases and some of the urban districts we work with, you have people that believe in what could be and the potential of what's there. And they believe in the teachers and they believe in the administrators. 
and they want to lend their skills and talents to the district. You have so other- you think you're getting better representation in the urban districts and not so much in areas like this? Is- I don't. I wouldn't say that. I think that, you know we we primarily we would probably work with more urban school districts than we do suburban school districts. So that's just the experience. The problems are just more on the surface, so they're more willing to reach out for yeah. help. Is that well? I think it's. Every, every single district, and even private schools have boards, every single one is very different, very different. You could be right next to each other and be very different. Uh, if you're in a public school and you're superintendent, you know, average turnover is like three to five years. You know, if they leave and you have a new leader, you don't know what's in store, just like any kind of organization or job, you know, CEO turns over. Are they really that much of separate entities? Like they're not following just state curriculum and things like that. I mean, obviously it's oh, going to be absolutely. an influential role, but, but might, is it going to be that different? You might have somebody. So we've got a, um, a district client right now. We just wrapped up a big research project with, and they called up and said, hey, exciting news. You know, our new superintendent has like a huge heart for CTE. And so we're going to go for a new bond. How do we, you know, better promote our career technical education? So they might have different experiences or maybe they've turned around a district or maybe they've seen great success in a different type of program. Or maybe they say, why is our dual language immersion program isolated to one school? This has been my experience. And I think we can bring this across a district or why is our online, why is our application on paper and they have to come, you know, to the, the city office to fill it out like I don't understand. Like so can, is the bottleneck normally at the superintendent level or is it normally at the school board level that where you find, because like, let's say you school have. School boards govern, so they're not there to manage. So they're there to make sure that funds are being appropriated correctly. That the management doing, comes down to the superintendent. The management is, is superintendent down. So deputies and assistant superintendents and you have department heads in different areas. And again, I it, to generalize is dangerous, right? So we know we've got one district, for example, and, and working with the special ed department, you know, parents will tell me the, the administrators at the district level are phenomenal, but we're not seeing the care in the classroom. And it's usually kind of flipped where it's, oh, our teachers are so amazing in this program, but we don't understand why they're not getting more support from the district. So, and, and it could vary school to school within a district. So it's, it's really difficult. Um, I think that's why. There's, there's probably a problem with, you know, increasing access and equitability across the entire country because it really almost just depends on where do you live and what resources do they have. Yeah, that's huge. And it's a complex problem. And it's going to be something we're going to probably be tackling for the rest of our lives in search Absolutely. of that, like, more perfect Probably union. our kids and their exactly. generations. And But I do see, you know, a shift. People recognize during the pandemic that there were more options out there. And so I think Yeah, people are homeschooling at a rate that is unbelievable. The amount of micro schools are, are becoming very big, which are very it's the technical definition or schools under a hundred, but most micro schools are maybe under twenty kids. So maybe you had somebody who was a teacher, um, started their own school. Um, we see and and some of them are based around themes. You know, in Colorado we see a lot of like outdoor education, uh, nature schools, you know, the schools that and are And this focused is all on, accredited and gets you in a university if you're in a micro school that's I mean you can on, get you can get in a university for homeschooled, right? So yeah, that's you know, true. you're showing you're you're going through your but state doesn't, curriculum. I was gonna say, doesn't the homeschool have to follow the state curriculum? They have it depending on where you are, like which I mean they either have a local curriculum or a state curriculum or their national standards. So if they're meeting it, they're meeting it. But wow. you're seeing, and you're seeing people are being more transient, saying, "Hey, we we haven't traveled for two years, and our family we're from a you know different country, so we're gonna we're peace out. We're gonna be over there for you know a year, spending time with family, and we're just gonna homeschool over there, or we're gonna find online curriculum that's accredited and just let them do that." So, there, I think people have recognized that there there are some more options, and I think also on the reverse, people who were so critical of perhaps public education or even private schools, you know, I, I saw a lot with some private schools. A lot of them did not close during the pandemic because people were following whatever rules because they're saying, listen, we're paying for school. So if schools closed because of a COVID outbreak. I've got to hire a nanny to come watch the kids or a babysitter, or I've got to stay, I've got to call in sick to be home with them. So we're going to follow everything to the T and make sure we don't close. And I think people on the flip side, a lot actually have a lot more respect for teachers and educators for what they do. We recognize that pretty quickly when parents are like, oh my gosh, like my child's kind of wild. 
Like I thought, you know, Johnny was perfect. Now put 25 of them in a classroom. Put 25 of them in the classroom. They play off each other. With nine different types of learning, dis- you know, differences or whatever the case might be. And I saw it even coaching, you know. I'd always, like, I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, this one little kid, he's cute as anything. But, man, he, he didn't mean bad. But every time he showed up, the other ones would just start laughing. He was like the class clown. And I'm thinking, like, what do you do with him if you have him for like a whole, like a whole year? And you can't, like, you can't trade, you know. You can't just say, like... <laughs> He's off, he's off the he's oh, off the team when he's on your classroom roster. So I think that the respect level for what educators do in in many instances increased. I joke with with our um, my daughter's first grade teacher. I supervised um, a trip to the zoo, and on the way back, I got all the first grade boys were around our seat, and we got stuck in traffic coming back for an hour and a half. And I just remember I told my called my husband. I'm like. Her gift just quadrupled this year because if that's what she's dealing with all here and she's still like that happy all the time, that woman like deserves some kind of reward that I cannot obviously. Like, I thought maybe a box of chocks would be good. I'm like, nah. <laughs> We're stepping it no, up. No, she needs dinner out. So we need a bottle of wine, something like that. So. Well, Amanda, it was an amazing podcast today. I don't know if you realize we've been speaking for two and a half hours. Oh, boy. Yeah. We have recorded a full length <laughs> feature film in the Marvel Universe, Look at us, huh? Infinity War. But it was, I feel like we touched on a great, uh, you know, we touched on diverse topics. We got your story, some of the things that you do. If there was anything else you'd want to capture in this moment or a glimpse of time, a message to people, uh, just anything that you'd like to capture, we'll put this on here and then uh, and then we'll wrap it up. That sounds good. Thanks. I think, you know, taking risks, and I think especially, you know, coming from a former athlete, but taking risks and following what could be, um, you know, starting my own business, it was risky. Leaving places like University of Michigan where I used to work and, you know, had, had a phenomenal team there and and to be able to do the things that I've done, I, I think can be scary, but if you're strategic and you recognize that there are going to be ups and downs that the grass isn't always greener I think is very important because I, th- I think once people find their passion and niche they're able to change the world in so many ways that I don't think that they would recognize if they didn't step out on their own so I would just encourage anybody I mean don't quit your job today if you don't <laughs> if you don't have savings and, and a plan in place but at least don't be shy about thinking about trying if there's something that you think you can make an impact on and whether it's education or nonprofit, or in sports, or something, because, you know, I, I don't know about the saying, if you love what you do, you never work a day, because you and I both know we love what we both do, and we work a lot more than people probably expect, but it's I think rewarding, the, though. I think the impact that people can make on the world, um, particularly in these areas that need it so bad, and if they have the skill set, they shouldn't be afraid to use them. There's a quote that's on my Facebook that says, the greatest gift you have to give is that of your own personal transformation. And when you find your passion or you have that feeling in your chest that you followed for a lot of your life and you're willing to step out and chase that thing, you bring like the greatest version of yourself to life. And if you do that, you empower so many more people than you realize because your voice, your words, your creations have an impact on the world. And if more people do that, it's like a fire it's just it's contagious it's infectious it provides warmth for the people around you Mm -hmm. you've provided a beautiful you know uh example for your children you've also affected communities you're spearheading campaigns and it's like if more people would realize that like you probably have a gift to give you probably have some tremendous impact that you can make on the world but you're gonna have to pursue it and you're gonna have to bring it to life and no matter how much I would like to bring it out of you or you Mm -hmm. would like to encourage to come out of someone they have to want to bring it into existence and if we can you know lay pathways forward and you know fix certain barriers to entries that we've discussed throughout this podcast more people will bring that beauty to light and the world's going to be a better place. So I feel like that's a perfect way to wrap the podcast up. I really enjoyed our time today. Um, you know, I might have to do a part two with your husband because we, we <laughs> wanted to keep going. But I really enjoyed the podcast today. And I hope a lot of people take, uh, you know, good messages from this. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.